hunter vanishes in one of the most unforgiving hunting grounds in America. When stuff goes bad, you know, everything happens and it happens quick. And I only had like 30 seconds. A one-day hunt in the Florida Everglades turns into four days trapped in a living hell. Really getting eaten alive. He outwits alligators and snakes. <laughs> only to suffer the deadliest of all challenges. It'd be easier just to give up and die right now. Hunting, fishing, and camping, often on his own, in the rugged hills of upstate New York, from the time he was a boy, have taught Jamie Mosh the crucial lessons of wilderness survival. I grew up in the city, but I just loved the outdoors, so that's what I did mostly, just hunt and fish. But I was always comfortable in the woods. In 2009, Jamie trades the familiar woods and streams of his home state for the semi-tropical southlands of Florida. But with him, he brought his love of the outdoors, which is how he met Matt Kepler while out fishing one day. And we got to talking on the pier and fishing together and really hit it off. And basically, uh, you know, we had a really great friendship ever since that day. I ended up switching from, you know, being a big game hunter to doing whatever kind of hunting I could do because in Florida, it's just a totally different kind of atmosphere from, you know, upstate New York. Whatever was possible, we ran out and tried to catch. On November 16th, 2009, Jamie meets two local hunters who offer to take him on a day of wild boar hunting. They invited me to go, and I'm, you know, so gung-ho about going out hunting. But I consider myself a very good hunter, so I figured I'd definitely be able to go out and get something. I assumed he was, you know, uh, going to go have a great time with these other hunters. I was excited to hear uh, how he did when he got back. Jamie gathers his gear and rides with them to their cabin deep in the Everglades. The plan is to get up with the dawn to hunt. In the morning when we woke up, I was putting on my hunting clothes and they went out to start the truck. What's up guys, ready to go hunt? Their truck wouldn't start. Uh, so they were gonna we're work on the truck. I don't know, it just wouldn't start this morning. So I said, well, I'm no mechanic. I'm going hunting. You guys can fix the truck. So they told me where to go. They said, walk down the road, you know, a mile or so, and cut into your left. So that's what I did. At 9 a.m., Jamie Mosh enters an environment like nothing he's ever encountered. The Everglades is a slow-moving river, 60 miles wide and 100 miles long. The dense sawgrass and razor-sharp palmettos provide habitat for wild boar, deer, snapping turtles, panthers, exotic giant pythons, and bull alligators. I had a 12-gauge Mossberg pump, compass. I had, you know, I had all my survival gear on my cell phone. I had everything that I needed. I had some water that day. So for the day, I was good to go. Jamie moves into the glades, putting miles between him and the cabin. It's a silent stalk through deep water and tangled vegetation, his mind on wild game. It was a really hot day that day, so nothing was really moving. Um, I saw some gators, saw some snakes, but I didn't see any pigs. Deeper and deeper, Jamie stalks, undeterred. The Everglades is 10 times more harsh of an environment than upstate New York. I thought I could handle it. It wasn't a big deal. It's nice, you know, being out there, seeing all the different things, being out in a different environment, seeing all the different animals, snakes and the alligators. Tired from dealing with the difficult terrain, Jamie stretches out on a patch of dry ground for a short nap. He awakens to the unexpected. When I woke up and realized it was dark, um, 
I figured, you know, you know, no big deal, I'll just walk out. But my flashlight was dead, all my stuff was dead, everything got wet that day. At night you can't move because you're literally, you can't see in front of your face, so I was stuck that night. So, I honestly didn't think it was a real big deal, you know? I've stayed out in 10 times worse conditions than this. You know, so I started a fire that night, had a fire, and, you know, I slept next to my gun, and it was, it was nice. With a broken compass, a waterlogged cell phone, and dead flashlight, Jamie is left with only his shotgun. He settles into his first night, surrounded by darkness and a vast marsh full of predators. But no amount of firepower and no amount of experience gained from years of hunting the placid woods of upstate New York would help him through the life and death ordeal awaiting him. Thirty-year-old Jamie Mosh has brought his New York State wilderness survival skills to the foreign territory of South Florida. Deep in the Everglades, he is far from the friends he has come hunting with, having endured an exhausting day of slogging through sloughs, ruining his compass, flashlight, and cell phone. Now, darkness has trapped him till morning. It got down to like 47 degrees or something, which is pretty cold. People don't know it gets that cold in November in Florida. Jamie's last chance to be located by his friends is to fire off the universal backwoods distress signal. He fires three fast, three slow, and then three fast shots. And I heard one gunshot, you know, it seemed pretty close, but I was pretty sure where it came from, so I marked an arrow in the ground that, that night so I could walk that way in the morning, you know. When Jamie does not return to the cabin, the other hunters contact the police and report him missing. Now Jamie's other friends and family know he's in jeopardy. I didn't really know what to think. Obviously, I was concerned, but Jamie d did have a lot of uh, survival skills, and my assumption was that he probably did make a fire and camped out there, and he'd make his way back out at daylight. I was up before the sun came up, you know. I was cold, I was ready to get moving. You know, my fire died off. I had no food, no water. So I was ready, I was very eager, you know, to get moving. So, so I could follow the sun as soon as it came up. I knew exactly which way to go. But thickets of sharp-edged palmettos and tangles of vines prevent Jamie from being able to maintain a direct path. Sometimes I'd have to take detours to go through because it was so thick you couldn't get through it. So you'd have to go in the water and then I'd end up chest deep in water that I didn't plan on going through, but I had to go through it to get to the next piece of land. It's now been over 24 hours and Jamie Mosh is beginning to realize the magnitude of his predicament. In this environment, when you get lost, it's not like New York where you can find a bend where you have hills or find something that you can pick out and walk towards, you know, so that way you have some point of direction to go towards and you can keep following that direction. So this is flat. There's nothing to uh, keep your bearings to know exactly where to go. With none of the usual landmarks common in his old hunting grounds to go on, Jamie is reduced to aimless wandering. He desperately tries to find some sign to point him back towards the hunting cabin. As, as the days progressed, I was uh, definitely becoming more concerned. I, I felt that something must have happened to him. Jamie knows he's undergoing a role change. From apex predator hunting the glades, he has now become potential prey, vulnerable to everything from the charge of a wild boar, snake bite, being caught by a python, or the attack of a gator. But most of all, he is at the mercy of the environment. I'm walking through some water that's, you know, probably three foot deep. I have my rubber boots on, you know, they go up to my knees and I'm stuck in mud. The swamp mud is acting like quicksand. And as I'm trying to take, you know, take a step, you know, my boots are coming off and I'm just like sinking further and further, but I didn't want to lose my boots. Like an Ice Age animal caught in a tar pit, Jamie fights against the gluey mud. I'm 
I'm sinking, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. <clears throat> Frantically, Jamie kicks hard to try and free himself from whatever is holding on to his boots. And I'm mud up to my waist, you know, and I'm stuck, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm sinking slowly in the mud. The tugging and kicking is churning the mud even more, and Jamie sinks faster. Even if he can escape drowning, he may still be trapped, immobile, for so long that other forces could take his life. End up up to water, up to my, um, up to my chin. The deeper Jamie Mosh sinks, the closer he is coming to dying alone and lost in the heart of the Everglades. Hunter Jamie Mosh, lost and alone deep in the Florida Everglades, is trapped in quicksand like mud and is moments from death. I started sinking, you know, and I had my gun in my left hand and I was hanging out to my, a branch with my right hand trying to keep me up. I only had like 30 seconds left, so I had to make a decision. Jamie needs both hands to survive. He tries to throw his gun to shore. Didn't make it to shore, of course, it landed in a swamp. Jamie's last hope to free himself is to slip out of his boots, pants, and gear. I unbuckled um, my fanny pack and my pants. So I was able to get out, slip out of the mud, and then there was three foot of water on top, which I was able to swim to shore to get out of the quicksand. The desperate plan works. Half naked, caked in mud, and unarmed, Jamie crawls from the deadly bog. Once I was on shore, you know, I took a breath and stuff. I wanted to get some of my gear back or get anything back. I kept going back into the water and just swimming on top of the water, sticking my hands like in the mud, trying to feel for anything. But I actually, I couldn't find anything. You know, the gun had sunk, my pants, this panty pack, like everything was gone. You know, now I'm real concerned. You know, I'm in a tank top. I have no gear. I don't know where I'm at. Um, I'm in a total environment where you don't want to be without shoes. Well, you know, you don't want to be without a gun. You don't want to be without any of your gear, you know what I mean? And I didn't have anything. Jamie's physical predicament could hardly be worse. He is now three days without food or drinking water. His gun and gear and even his clothes have been lost. All he can see is unbroken thickets of sawgrass and palmetto. Jamie's ordeal is mirrored by the anguish his friends and family are enduring. Not knowing was definitely uh, the hardest part. Did he have a fall and injure himself? Was he bitten by a snake? Was it an alligator? Jamie has not had anything to drink. He fears swamp-borne disease. Then luckily, he comes upon a natural spring. You don't find too many rocks in the Everglades, and there's like water in it, crystal clear water, and every little mud puddle in Florida has these little guppies in there, little dullies, little minnows. Jamie uses his shirt as a filter to catch the guppies. I was eating the guppies, you know, just, you know, not very many, just what I could catch in my shirt. Caught a couple frogs, ate them. As he drinks the spring water and eats the tiny fish, he realizes there could be a heartier meal. I remember I was down on my hands and knees, like, slurping this water, and it's like, eel looking like thing, like, came out. I thought it was like a snake, like, came out, like, to, like, to bite my lip or something, you know, so I jumped back. I ended up getting a stick and wiggling it in front of the hole, and when he came out, I ended up grabbing it from behind, so I ended up getting it, I ate that. It's now four days into Jamie Moshe's ordeal. He's been slashed by vines and devoured by insects. I'm drenched, you know, from walking through swamps all day. I'm caught up. The bugs are horrendous there. You know, I was covered from head to toe. There wasn't one spot on me that didn't have a bug bite. Really getting eaten alive. I've never seen anything like it.
wading through waist-deep water, Jamie is on the alert for venomous snakes, pythons, and aggressive alligators. But the real danger is something unexpected that may halt the lost hunter in his tracks. I end up twisting my leg in some, uh, and in between some branches, I'm gonna pop my knee out. On top of all his other trials, Jamie now has to deal with a dislocated knee that may reduce him to immobility. He must take action. When you pop your knee out, it hurts really bad for the first 10 seconds when you do it. But after a half hour, it swells up so big and it's pretty much like it's broken. You can't do anything, you can't move it. And I knew for a fact, you know, if I don't pop my knee back in pretty soon, within a couple minutes, it's gonna swell so big, I'm not gonna be able to pop it back in. I'm not gonna be able to move, I'm just gonna be stuck. Jamie will have to treat his injury himself if he hopes to keep walking his way out. He braces himself. He must force his kneecap back into place. Blinding pain shoots through Jamie. Now, without a gun, gear, or a way to make a fire, he faces having to hobble on. Worse than all, though, is the spreading sense of despair. I've been going through this for days, you know, I'm just thinking, I'd rather just die, pretty much, and do this. For hunter Jamie Mosh, the Florida Everglades' 4,000 square miles of tangled vegetation have become a death trap, while his family and friends can only hope and pray. It was a very helpless feeling. Uh, all we could really do was talk to each other and try and keep our spirits up, and we had everybody here on the case, and we had, there was uh, so many people involved that he was gonna be found, I was, I was sure of it. For four days, Jamie has been under siege from the environment. He survives insects, no food, a near drowning, and along the way has lost his shotgun, gear, boots, and even his clothes. He's dislocated his knee and can only hobble forward. He tries to suppress dark thoughts. After I pop my leg back in, um, I, uh, sort of like got a second wind, you know, after I was feeling sorry for myself, thinking about killing myself, and, you know, thinking about this, and I was thinking about my mother and my friends, and thinking about everybody. It was like, you know what? If anybody can make it out of this, you can make it out of this. For his family and friends, whom he knows are waiting for him, he presses on. Then he sees helicopters flying overhead. I keep seeing these helicopters, and they're flying over top of me, but they're not seeing me. The helicopters are a beacon of hope that the search is on for him. Jamie knows that if he is going to be saved, he must aid in his own rescue. I end up climbing up this tree and sitting in this tree for a couple hours in the morning trying to get a chopper to fly by. I could see him. Of course, no helicopters fly by the whole time I'm up there. I could see him miles away, but none came by me the whole time. Jamie's efforts prove futile. Facing defeat, he climbs down from his perch. He's ready to give up. I find this hot spot and I lay down and, um, and, you know, it's in like, like a little clearing. Then, a miraculous sound. You know, I'm hearing Jamie, Jamie, and then I start hearing it get further and further away. Suddenly I screamed out, help! And, uh, help. you know, they screamed my name and, Over here. you know, I said, yeah, you know, I'm Jamie. And they came over and uh, they found me. You know, I started crying and I busted out in tears. You know, I was just so overwhelmed, you know, that <laughs> I was found, you know. Face, we found Jamie. He's banged up, but uh, he's alive. Drained of emotion, Jamie feels true exhaustion set in as his rescuers help him from the glades. He looked like he had walked out of a horror movie. He was cut from head to toe, cuts on top of mosquito bites, on top of cuts. It was it looked pretty gruesome, but he was uh, in good spirits and, and otherwise healthy. It, it was amazing to see him. It was amazing. Uh, I just, yeah, surreal almost, but, uh, a joyous occasion. 
And I was just so happy to see everybody, like my whole family, you know. I felt bad that I put everybody through what I did. They had to go through all this, you know. I know it must have been hell for them just thinking that they lost their friend or they lost their child. This harrowing incident has given Jamie a new perspective on life. I definitely live each day with a little bit more love for life. I appreciate my friends and my family 10 times more because you really don't know what's going to happen the day after the next. So you got to tell your parents that you love them, tell your friends that you love them. You learn anything, you know, of this whole incident. Always be prepared, you know, and uh, just remember anything can happen at any time. Jamie Mosh continued his life as an avid outdoorsman. In the spring of 2013, shortly after sharing this story, Jamie passed away suddenly. His incredible story of survival remains a testament to the adventurous spirit that guided his life. It's every sailor's worst nightmare his boat being ripped open, forced to abandon ship in rough seas. I knew the boat was doomed. Lost and adrift, fighting thirst, hunger, and exposure. Chances of survival were basically zero. With sharks circling like buzzards. Freaking out, you're gonna die, you're gonna die. Staying alive becomes an epic battle with the mind and the Atlantic in one man's fight to survive. I'm Craig DiMartino. There are few stories in the history of survival tales as powerful as Steve Callahan's. Being lost at sea is not just a struggle against the elements, but a fight that plays out in the deep recesses of the human mind. It's a place where loneliness and despair can grow to become enemies far greater than hunger, thirst, or predators from the deep. Sailors who challenge the ocean will tell you that they don't really control what's happening around them. They only adapt to what the sea dictates, and how well they adapt decides whether they live or die. It's a valuable lesson that Steve Callahan started learning at a young age. My Boy Scout master had a small boat, and he would ask kids if they wanted to go out sailing. I kind of lay down on the boat and looked out at the waves, which were sort of the same eye level, and it felt very womb-like. I felt really at home. Steve had a knack for reading the waves, the wind, and the currents, and how to get a boat to do what he wanted at sea is where he wanted to be. I was probably a lot more comfortable with nature without man than, than in society with people. Sailing and rock climbing have a little bit in common, I think. Craig DiMartino talked to Steve about that intangible lure of the sea. It's a real zen-like experience, you know, it, when you get the boat in sync, you're, you're you're moving with the waves and this really dynamic surface and with the wind, everything's varying all the time and so you're in total touch with what's happening at that moment and the past and the future kind of disappear in terms of importance and you're just very, very present. It's a spiritual place for me. It's like, I don't know, you go climbing in Yosemite or any place right. like that with the, the grand you're, you're confronted with, it's, it's humbling and it's awesome. Steve became a skilled mariner and ship designer. In 1980, he built the Napoleon Solo, a 21-foot cruiser responsive to light winds and forgiving in heavy weather. Part of the reason for building Napoleon Solo was to show that you could build a boat that performed well, that could be a home, and wasn't you know, a huge yacht or anything, that you could be very self-contained and you could do this on a relatively limited budget. In the fall of 1981, Steve and his friend Chris sailed the Napoleon Solo from Bermuda to England. The two men successfully crossed the Atlantic in less than two weeks. Steve's next trip would be on his own, a solo journey back across the Atlantic to Antigua. Steve thought the voyage would be easy. That was going to be the milk run going across the ocean. It blows hard a lot, but it's all from behind, or mostly from behind. So I thought I'd just glide right down to the Caribbean. But Steve was mistaken. On January 29th, 1982, Steve and the Napoleon Solo set sail from the Canary Islands into the vast Atlantic. The first few days passed uneventfully, but Steve was sailing into the teeth of a huge storm. The wind started picking up, and the waves grew. 
so I figured I was in for a bit of a blow, but the boat and I had been through several blows that were worse. Soon the winds built into a gale. I was just under a storm jib, the main was completely furled, and the boat was just like clicking along, doing five, six knots across these waves, and every once in a while a big breaker would hit the side of the boat, boom. Throughout the day and night, the relentless storm battered his craft. I kept getting up and checking things out, make sure everything's okay, try to be proactive in these things, and everything seemed good. I was like looking at all the seams in the boat and how the bulkheads were and everything, everything seemed cool. Steve did his routine check. The boat was holding steady. He hit his bunk for a rest. Then, disaster. So suddenly there was this big bang on the side of the boat. A lot of water came in immediately. I knew the boat was doomed like from a nanosecond after it happened. Napoleon Solo crashed into something big and the hull ripped open. Cold ocean water quickly swamped the boat. With only seconds to react, Steve collected his survival gear. There's part of me that's freaking out. You're gonna die, you're gonna die. And there's part of me, you know, slap that guy and just say, shut up, let me do my thing. It was dark and I couldn't see and I just kind of leapt up and started acting in, in accordance with my training. I had a life raft up on the deck. I tried to get the emergency kit out, but I couldn't. The boat started nosing down. His next decision didn't come easily. And the water was like, just going up like this. And so I thought, hey, it's doomed. I gotta get out of here and get in the raft or this thing's gonna sink and take me down with it. Seven days into his solo transatlantic trip, Steve Callahan's boat collided hard with something beneath the waves. As his boat sank, he launched his self-inflating life raft into the pitching seas. A line tethered the raft to the swamp boat. Once I got into the life raft, I didn't want to leave Napoleon Solo until I absolutely had to because that boat contained food, water, <laughs> all kinds of things. Watertight compartments that Steve had built into the Napoleon Solo kept it from sinking immediately. That gave me a chance to get back on board and dive down and get some really critical equipment, especially this emergency bag that I had. Still tethered to the boat, the raft too was in danger of being swamped. And these big waves that would come by would hit the raft and just like smash it. It's like being in an auto accident every few minutes. It would just like completely collapse the raft and I'd get pinched in there and water would come flying in everywhere and I was really worried that the raft was gonna tear itself to bits. But Callahan didn't want to cut loose from his boat and lose his best chance of surviving this ordeal. I was going through all these kind of dream-like scenarios of oh, well maybe if it gets light, I can see where the damage is and maybe I I can figure out a way of repairing it and pump the boat out and actually carry on my way. You know, you never want to leave the boat until you know it's completely doomed. But the raging sea made the decision for him. There was suddenly one of these big waves that came and hit the raft, and then it seemed suddenly very peaceful. And I looked out and I was drifting away from Napoleon Solo. In the darkness, Callahan watched his boat as it was pushed further and further away by the waves. In a way, it was like, oh, now I'm totally at the mercy of what's gonna happen to me, but I kind of already figured that out. <laughs> right. And um, the fact of the matter was, uh, the, the raft was getting so beaten up by the ocean, uh, being tied to the boat, that I, I kind of felt a relief. Now he was truly alone, tossed from wave to wave in a storm-churned ocean. That's really when I hammered myself for all my failures and all that kind of stuff. Steve noted the date, February 5th, day one of his new life. The first thing I did was tie everything into the raft. With the raft being vulnerable, you know, you lose a bit of equipment, that's it, you're done.
His top priority was food and water. Luckily, the survival kit had eight one-pint cans of fresh water, a can of peanuts, a bag of dry beans, and a box of raisins. So for the time being, his immediate needs were taken care of. It really was a very, very difficult time. I was like, well, how am I going to live out here? I, I don't have enough water. I don't have enough food to even get to the shipping lanes. So I figured my chances of survival were basically zero. Steve Callahan's dream of sailing solo across the Atlantic sank along with his boat. Now he has been adrift in the ocean for over a week. Surviving this ordeal would take a lot more reserves than his limited supplies. I started to adapt the attitude that this is not the end of a voyage, it's a continuation. It's just in a little bit more humble craft. So develop a shipboard routine, keep a log, exercise, navigate, normalize life as much as possible in order to get through this period of disorientation and fear into a period of adaptation or the survival routine. Steve took a careful inventory of everything he managed to salvage from his boat. Almost all survival experiences are somehow trying to figure out how to solve problems in an isolated environment with limited resources. And in a life raft, the resources are pretty limited. So you get right down to basics of living and what you really need. He had grabbed some medical supplies, coils of line of various diameters, and a fishing kit. It was like, you know, 50-foot piece of string and a little trout hook, and I was like, yeah, maybe I'll catch a few bait fish or something with this, but it was pretty useless. More valuable was a stock of signal flares. I had a whole arsenal of flares of very good types, parachute flares, which go up, they pop a little parachute, they hang in the air for a very long time. Plus, I had meteor flares that would go up and down much quicker, and then hand location flare. So the idea is you send up the, like the parachutes first, if somebody sees that, they get close to you, and then you do the hand flares. Also in the kit was a last minute addition he had picked up just before he started his trip. A little shorty spear gun that I bought in the Canary Islands. I figured, well, this might come in handy when I get to the Caribbean, maybe I'll do a little spear fishing, but it was really almost a toy. He also had an emergency radio transmitter which sends out an SOS signal. And they were being monitored by aircraft, but an aircraft had to be within about 250 miles of you or nobody would hear you. It would only transmit a signal as long as its battery lasted. It was a long shot that any airliner would be passing over that empty part of the ocean. However, the most critical piece of survival gear was decidedly the most low-tech, a saltwater distillation still. It's like a little environment where you can pour seawater from the top and it drips down the inside in this black cloth, which the idea is that the sun comes out and evaporates fresh water out of the salt and it collects on the inside of this balloon and rains down on the inside into a little collection bag. Without fresh water, Steve would die. After many frustrating failed attempts, Steve got the still to work. He started producing a few ounces of fresh water just as his canned supply ran dry. I had eight pints to start with, which was a good start, and that gave me a window of opportunity to get the solar stills working, and then they would produce maybe a pint, pint and a half a day on a good day. A few other little items, easily overlooked, also proved helpful to Steve. One of the most important things that I had were these little dime store pads of paper and pencils because that would allow me to keep a log and, and, and that was really important to me both from a pragmatic level in terms of doing navigational notes and stuff, knowing when, oh, now I'm going through a shipping lane, I should keep better watch for ships, to the psychological element of 
this being a continuation of a voyage. Uh, I'm still in command of a little boat, I'll keep a log, and be able to step outside all the pain and frustration and all of that and be able to observe things almost like a third person looking down upon me. And, th and that was really important. Bobbing along behind the raft was a tall marker buoy salvaged from the boat. Tethered by a line, the buoy was there to help would-be rescuers spot the raft as he moved with the westward current. From a few yellow pencils, Steve fashioned a rudimentary sextant. During the day, he estimated his latitude, and with the night stars, he plotted his course. The line that I had out the back was basically a 70-foot piece of line, so I made up a little speed distance table, like a little speedometer, and I could time seaweed or something floating by. He knew his approximate speed and his current location, and roughly how far he was from the closest islands in the Caribbean. So Steve crunched the numbers to figure out how long he had to drift before he made landfall. The arithmetic dealt a sobering blow a number that no one, drifting alone, had ever endured before. Steve Callahan was on a solo transatlantic voyage when he was forced to abandon ship in the middle of the ocean. The good news for Steve was that after nearly two weeks in the Atlantic, he was drifting towards the Caribbean islands. The bad news, at his current speed, it would take him two months to get there. It just seemed like I'm 30 years old and what have I done? Well, I've drawn a few pictures, I designed a couple of boats, and I died. <laughs> you know, that was, it was really pretty grim. Miraculously, he spotted a cargo ship in the distance. He scrambled to fire a few flares. And the ship just goes steaming right by. And it was close enough I could smell the diesel in the air. The vessel disappeared over the horizon. And I was pretty upset. A number of large fish started to swim alongside and tag along with the raft. These were Dorados, square-headed, three-foot-long aquamarine fish with yellow tails. They're popularly known as mahi-mahi. Steve took aim with the spear gun. I might hit one, but not strong enough so that it wouldn't go through the fish. And within about 24 hours, they knew exactly what the range of my spear gun was, and they'd be like swimming just outside that range. The large 30 to 40 pound fish darted close to the raft and often intentionally struck the raft. Big males, which have very bony, square shaped heads, would hit it quite powerfully. In fact, when I was lying down inside, I have to make sure that my head was on like a gear bag or something like that, because otherwise it'd be just like somebody coming up and just whacking me. Steve leaned over the raft, poised for hours with spear gun at the ready awaiting an unsuspecting fish. He nailed it. Fresh food for the first time in weeks. When I caught the first fish, all of a sudden the other fish that were there went into this kind of frenzy and they kept smacking the bottom of the raft, just smack, 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 and wouldn't get, let me have any rest or anything. And I felt like I was caught in this Alfred Hitchcock birds kind of thing. It was the, I mean, the fish, and the fish are eventually gonna destroy the raft and eat me. And that went on for quite a while. Steve cut the fish meat into one inch thick strips, six inches long. He pierced a hole in the strip and hung it from a string he'd tied across one corner of the raft. He called this area the butcher shop. And I start eating it, and it was like, oh man, this is good. One fish gave enough food for three or four days. Days passed into weeks. Steve's shipboard routine kept his mind on the task at hand, survival. Along with his still and collected rainwater, a steady supply of fish and even an occasional bird kept his body nourished but there were always present dangers from the elements and the sea that could take his life at any moment. I was concerned about sharks. I wasn't concerned so much that they were gonna like 
leap up and drag me out of the raft or something like that. But I knew that it could be quite aggressive. I was kind of asleep and all of a sudden on the bottom of the raft was this flat, 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 flat. And it was a Dorado. And then boom, the whole raft was like thrown off the surface of the water. And it was a shark going after the Dorado that was under the raft. I was, of course, heart in the mouth and the whole bit. And I grabbed the spear gun and I kept jabbing at it. And I finally got a couple of good hits on it and it went away. Whatever challenge he faced, Steve never let go of his lifeline, his daily routine. There were always jobs to do, and I would concentrate on doing jobs while trying to conserve energy and having some kind of a balance in there. And then dusk would finally come along, and I would fish and uh, call it a day. <laughs> in his small notebooks, Steve tallied the monotonous passing of the days. Everything was going as well as could be expected until March 19th, day 43 of this epic survival journey. Steve had speared a Dorado. The fish broke away, and with the spear point sticking through its side, it rammed the raft. It tore a four-inch gash in the raft just below the waterline. The raft began to deflate. On the 43rd day, when the Dorado tore into the, the tube, and that was the low point. I wasn't going any further. Out of steam, physically, emotionally, mentally, and it was clear that, you know, this was all for naught. I just spent the last month and a half or whatever just struggling, and I'm not gonna be able to get back and fix anything, and I'm gonna die here, and all my past sins are gonna remain, uh, and I can't do anything about it. The withering raft made it impossible to keep the fresh water still functioning. And it was getting harder to catch and butcher fish in the deflating raft. If he couldn't patch the gaping hole, the consequences were dire. The raft would collapse and send Steve to the bottom of the ocean. Steve knew an answer had to be within reach, somewhere amongst the scraps of gear he stowed in the raft. His life depended on figuring out a solution. Find out how on the next Fight to Survive. March 19th, 1982. Steve Callahan has been adrift in the middle of the Atlantic for 43 days. He's so far out to sea that he's beyond the range of any effective search by ship or aircraft. His sailboat sank after hitting a large object in the dark. As it went down, he made it into his emergency raft with a limited amount of food, water, and useful survival tools. An experienced sailor with an iron will and belief he would survive. He used every bit of knowledge and skill to stay alive. But on the 43rd day, everything changed. A gash in the side of the rubber tube threatened to sink the raft. Steve tried, but couldn't stop the crippling leak. Craig DiMartino had to face his own dark moments as he laid on the ground with his leg shattered. Craig asked Steve what he was feeling as he struggled to stay alive. That was the low point. I wasn't going any further. Out of steam, physically, emotionally, mentally, and then it was clear that, you know, this was all for naught. I just, like, I just spent the last month and a half or whatever just struggling, and I'm not gonna be able to get back and fix anything, and I'm gonna die here, and all my past sins are gonna remain, and I can't do anything about it. But then it became, do I have enough energy in me? Do I have enough wherewithal to actually get myself together enough to give it one more go? For Steve, that week had started like so many others. My routine was pretty fixed. I would wake up, look around to the whole horizon, making sure there's no ship out there. 
if I had anything to eat, I would, you know, have breakfast. And then I would do exercises, and I would fish if fish were around. Fishing meant waiting patiently with his small spear gun for just the right moment to strike. At first, I was using it as a conventional spear gun, shooting at the fish. And very soon after I started using it, I went to reload the spear in it, and the strap had disappeared. Without the spear gun, without a way to get fish, Steve would starve. With some of the line in the survival kit, he meticulously lashed the spear to the stock. But that's not how it's made to be used. Usually straight through and then you're pulling on the spear, it's in tension. But if I've got this fish on the end of it, there's a lot of load on this tiny little shaft, so it's often bending it. A lot of twisting, so I'm having to improve the lashing system. Survival demanded keen attention to the most minute details. It's lots of teeny, teeny, teeny little detail, like every little thing is important. And also trying to be careful, careful, careful that I don't lose anything else. The next thing that happened, I finally spear another Dorado, and it does this kind of like little twirly, 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 and swims off, and I'm, I pick up the end of the spear, and I'm just amazed because it's unscrewed the spear tip and gone. With the survival kit knife, Steve jerry-rigged a new point for the spear. The improvised weapon proved a lifesaver. Sharks would come, and they would often bump the raft just to see if there's some kind of a reaction. And that's kind of how I dealt with sharks, was to think that they were like most predators, that if you pose a threat to them, they're less likely to cause you problems. So whenever one would come along, even though I knew I couldn't really hurt it, I would jab at it with a spear. If I got a couple of good hits on it, it would go away. On day 43, Steve prepared to fish again. That afternoon, he waited patiently over the edge of the raft. A Dorado swam by and Steve speared it. Then the big fish twisted wildly toward the raft. This time it broke the shaft of the spear and kind of turned around and ran against the raft. Instantly, the raft's lower tube deflated. Air gushed from the six-inch tear. With the bottom tube deflated, the water pressure would push up in the inside so that it was like this dome on the inside of rubber. And if I step in it, it's like being in rubber quicksand, which I was worried about my legs sticking down in the water and sharks and stuff grabbing that. Steve's whole world quickly crumbled around him. It made it really hard to tend to the solar still almost impossible to fish. And it also gave me only about this much freeboard. So any even minor waves were washing in and out of the raft. I was wet all the time and it was, it was miserable. He knew the first big wave could swamp the raft and that would be the end. It was just such a stark thing. So I pulled myself up and I went through this really intense mind game of what I had in the raft, what could possibly fix this repair. He didn't have any adhesive patches big enough to cover the hole. So he squeezed the ripped rubber edges together like puckered lips on a mouth and tightly wrapped them with line. I tried external pressure patches and trying harder and harder to tie it tight. Nothing worked, so I went through this for 10 days, 24-7, just trying to deal with this leak, and it just completely exhausted me, and I finally just kind of collapsed back in the raft, and I thought that was it. The raft was barely afloat and still a 1,000 miles from land. Steve hadn't been able to fish and restock his food supply. The solar distillation still had quit working, and he was nearly out of drinking water. I remember feeling really sorry for myself again, breaking down and feeling the water kind of washing in and out of the raft and just feeling my life just ebbing away. For 10 days, Steve Callahan struggled to stop the leak that plagued his raft. None of his fixes worked. Maybe I can get myself together enough to have one more shot at this. 
if I don't get my act together here now, this one time. I wasn't just talking about the remote possibility now that this, this is a matter of hours away. I'm gonna be dead, that's all there is to it. And then it dawned on me, ah, oh, I know what I need to do. As often as the case, in order to fix a problem, you often have to make them worse. His new plan required that he make the hole even bigger. He also needed to sacrifice the stainless steel eating utensils from his survival kit. I can use those as pins. I broke the handle off of a, a fork, and then I cut slits in the top and the bottom of the lips. And I put the foam tongue in, and I drove that pin down through the whole thing. And then behind it, I could wind lashings and make them really tight. And then it didn't matter how much pressure was in the raft. The line and everything couldn't be forced off because it was being held by that, by that pin. With the hand pump, Steve reinflated the raft. The repair worked. The raft was stable again. Even though I felt really proud of myself for coming up with the answer, I'm also berating myself for being so stupid I couldn't have figured it out like a week beforehand. With the repair complete, Steve focused on restarting the neglected solar still and restocking his food supply. I got pretty skinny and it was very interesting to me to see what happened to my body because all the fat goes first and all those bits of your body that you're not using a lot. So, you know, the rear end's gone. Don't need that. Legs got really, really skinny even though I could stand up on the raft and tried to, you know, like holding on to it. And it was kind of like, a bit like walking on water. <laughs> but I, I got pretty good at it after a while. And my legs were strong enough to keep me up, but they were pretty thready by the end of it, you know, sort of knobby knees. My upper body, which I used the most, my body reserved the most strength for. So it, it remained in fairly decent shape compared to the rest of me. Steve caught enough of the large Dorados and other small fish to keep himself from starving. But without any fruits or vegetables, scurvy might kill him. There was always that nagging of being hungry, always. I found it very interesting that every time I slept that I would dream of foods and drinks. But I never dreamt of steak or fish. It was always beautiful breads and fruit and all the stuff that my body needed. A tangle of kelp floated by. Steve plucked it from the water and ate what he could to get some critical vitamins and to supplement his monotonous diet of fish. As time went on, I became much more interested in what was inside the fish than the flesh. The fish eyes, which were nuggets of fluid uh, between the vertebrae, all those little discs, they were kind of fluid-like. Fresh fish liver, heart, all those things inside the fish which were providing me with vitamins and minerals and fats. He couldn't eat an entire fish in one sitting, so he devised a way to stockpile the meat. His own fish jerky. They'd be roughly one inch square sections by, you know, however long. And I'd hang them up on all these strings which would dry in the sun. And so sometimes they would keep for a really long time. Aside from extreme weight loss, Steve suffered unavoidable saltwater sores. They start as like little bumps on the skin, turning into these kind of pimples that end up opening up. So you have an open ulcer, much like a canker sore or something like that. It forms on the skin and they tend to be in places where you're wet a lot and compressed, like hips, but I would end up with hundreds of these all over me, and they're very painful because, first of all, they're open ulcers, and secondly, I'm living in a salt-encrusted environment. After 60 days adrift, the raft was stable, and Steve was winning his fight against starvation. But he feared another battle, an even more difficult challenge was looming on the horizon. Every day for the last eight weeks, Steve Callahan had managed to plot his approximate location. He had measured his speed, and he'd kept a log of how far west the currents had been carrying him. He estimated he was still four or five weeks away from making landfall somewhere in the Caribbean. As the days turned into weeks, the effort to survive each day surprisingly grew a bit easier. I was surviving literally in a rubber tent in the middle of a wilderness fishing for a few hours a day. And I just became starkly aware of how much of our lives are spent dealing with all this stuff that we don't really need. 
that we want but we don't really need and yet the irony is that the things that mean the most to me don't come from them anyway. Through the entire voyage, I think that's something that helped me quite a lot was to recognize, at least intellectually, even if I wasn't having a good time, that there were these wonders around me. At night I would stand up and I'd look out and all the fish would be kind of hovering under the raft, just pacing along and each one you could see their entire shape as they would go through this glittering underwater thing like silver platters. It sounds like a simple thing, but for me in that position at that time, it was like touching God or something. With no one to share his thoughts, Steve jotted down his observations in his small notebooks. I wrote in the log, to me, this is a view of heaven from a seat in hell. For this little me, Stephen, I was in pain and I was suffering and I was dying, but there was this other part, this very open, expansive spiritual part. I feel spiritually touched by nature where one is confronted directly with one's insignificance. I feel truly humbled in the seat certainly does that, and in the life raft it was that times a million. The loneliness took a toll, but companionship would have come with a deadly price. I longed for people most of the time, but I was also aware that had I had somebody with me that one or the other of us or both of us would have died because I just didn't have enough water for the two of us. After nearly two months, the freshwater solar still had slowly deteriorated but the raft had drifted closer to the Caribbean and the skies filled with welcome rain. Steve rigged a scrap of survival blanket as a rain collection system. Early on, my equipment was all working pretty well. You know, I, yeah, I had to pump up the raft a lot and stuff like that, but basically it was, it was okay. The raft itself was guaranteed by the manufacturer to hold together for 40 days. Steve was already weeks past that expiration date. Would the waterproofing and the glued seams hold the raft together long enough for Steve to reach land? I started going through this period where I was going, maybe I'm like a flying Dutchman. Maybe I'm dead. Maybe this is what I deserve for all my past, you know, sins. The thought occurred to me, like, maybe I'm just doomed to drift forever out here. Steve Callahan's raft was slowly crumbling. His solar water still finally gave out, and by day 75, it looked like he'd never be rescued. But then, the gentle current brought him a glimmer of hope. As far as the eye can see, I came upon these tangles of trash and weed, sargassum weed, and other kinds of weed, and it was all bundled up and, and just going forever. And Although as horrible as that was, it, for me it was a fantastic sign. I'm on the edge of something. Steve had reached the edge of the shipping lanes, routes trafficked by freighters crisscrossing the Caribbean Sea. On the 75th night, I got up and I looked out and there were kind of like these little glows on the horizon and there were several of them. I was really getting more and more jazzed up like, hmm, this is something, There's, that, they might not be boats, they might actually be something on land. And then finally I saw the, what was the loom of a lighthouse definitively because there was a pulse and a, a pause and a pulse pulse and it repeated over and over and over again. So the next morning I expected to kind of get up and maybe see something way off in the distance. But actually it was pretty close. I could see details on the land. I could see that there was an island right in front of me and then I heard an engine. And it's getting closer and closer and closer. And I look out and I see these fishermen coming out to me. They come up to the boat and they're talking some kind of language. I don't know what it is. I, I, I can, really can't figure it out. It's not really Spanish, it's not French, what is it? Well, it turns out it's Creole and I'm not understanding a word of it. 
<laughs> we load the raft up on the bow of the boat and roar into the island. The fishermen sped Steve to the tiny island of Marie Galant. To Steve's good luck, the currents had drifted him to the easternmost of the Caribbean islands, just south of Guadeloupe. In 76 days, he drifted nearly 2,000 miles. They come up towards the beach, and I'm so excited. You know, here's land, here's land, and there's a beautiful beach. I immediately just fall flat in my face on the beach. These two local guys just grab me by the arms and they just like lift me up and take me up to the local gendarme and sit me in a metal chair and somebody thrusts a cold ginger beer in my hand, which was like, oh my God, this is so heaven. <laughs> Helpful locals delivered Steve to the hospital where he was looked after for a few days. He contacted his parents that he was safe. Drawing from his pencil logs of the 76-day journey, Steve wrote a book titled Adrift. His vivid retelling caught the attention of film director Ang Lee. Lee talked with Steve and asked him for his input and advice on his 2012 film about a young man's struggle to survive a shipwreck, The Life of Pi. Some of the gifts that I feel like I was given from the voyage, I found that I was a lot stronger and more adaptable than I thought I was, which is certainly important. But actually, the equal gift was being confronted by all my failures and shortcomings. I think that was a real gift. It gave me a chance to come back and try to make things a little better. The ocean and sailing almost killed you. You didn't wait that long, jumped right back on a boat. People don't stop doing what they're doing right. because they have an accident. The bottom line is, is that even though I went through this kind of horrible experience, um, I gained so much from it. I tell people that too, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't take it back. I wouldn't want to go through it again. Yeah. Same idea, but what I've learned and seen, I would have not seen and learned. Yeah. You know, I would have probably just kept doing what I was doing. People, I think, in society want they don't want, they don't they like want more security. They, they, like they want to get rid of that risk. You know, everybody suffers in life. Everybody goes through crises. Um, and if I was the 62-year-old Steve and I knew the 29-year-old Steve was going to go and have this experience and it was going to be really hard for him, but all the stuff that he would gain from it in the long run, it'd be like, go for it. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to tell you what happens. Be prepared. It ain't going to be easy, but you know, you're going to just, you're just going to have this amazing experience and it's going to take you down a lot of roads you could never have imagined. A father and daughter and a lifelong shared love of the hunt. But the determination to take an elk drives one to dive dangerously deep into the Oregon wilderness. It was excruciating pain. <laughs> the enemy is savage, lethal cold. My body was shutting down. And father and daughter will discover the depth of their love during a desperate search. If I don't get found, I'm going to freeze to death. It's only natural that Michelle Heilman would grow up hunting and fishing with her father, Benny, in the rugged and spectacular Wallowa Mountains in a remote part of northeastern Oregon. Wallowa is a beautiful country. A lot of people call it little Switzerland. I've seen Switzerland. It is a lot like it. Beautiful mountains, clear streams, beautiful rivers, and Every way you turn, you can see mountains. For a hunter and angler, there may be no better place on Earth. 
I've been a hunter and a fisherman for as long as I can remember. Uh, Michelle and I have hunted together since she was old enough to go. She killed her first deer when she was about 14. Dad also taught her to be a skilled marksman and to have an appreciation for hunting firearms. I think my proudest moment was a four-point buck. He was big and I made a contribution to the freezer. Now, a mild October day during elk season is about to usher in an ordeal for the Heilmans. When I woke up on October 27th, I didn't have any intentions of going elk hunting. I was going up to my folks' place. I was going to take care of their critters while they went out elk hunting. And um, my mother, when I had got there, she says, I just don't feel good. You go out with your dad. You spend time with your dad. And I said, I'm pooped. <laughs> I don't want to go out. I want to get that elk done. In spite of her fatigue, Michelle decides it will be worth it to spend time with her dad on the hunt and to have the chance of taking her elk this season. It was nice. The sun was shining. I mean, it was great. No complaints. Benny's plan for the day is to go where they've seen fresh tracks. He'll set Michelle out and set up ahead of her as she walks the woods toward him. They'll see what she pushes out. We had been in the same general area the day before, so uh, I had told her that I did not want to walk that morning. I was, my knees were hurting me really bad. And I says, I'll let you out, and I want you to walk. I didn't want her to cross the road, and I didn't want her to cross the fence. All right. Good luck. Thank you. See ya. It looks like a successful tactic when Michelle comes on to a trio of elk. When I started the walk, it wasn't 10 minutes, and I jumped the three, the bull, the cow, and the calf, and they went straight up, straight down, and I followed. I got one shot off, and that was it. Needing to know if she's wounded the bull, Michelle stays on the trail, ignoring her father's warning about the road and pushing down into a black canyon. My dad had said, don't cross the road. And I had thought, you know, he's done it 101 times. I'm going to do it. I may have my elk this year. I'm going to follow. I didn't think about telling anybody where I was going. Michelle's determination draws her deeper into treacherous territory. Once I crossed the road, followed the elk down into a little ravine, and the elk went down, crossing into a, another draw, and then into a canyon, I followed. And they just kept going straight down. And when I finally lost sight of them is when I took stock of my settings, looked around. It was probably about 4 o'clock, and I was at the bottom and thought, oh boy, I've got to walk all the way back up. Michelle Heilman is lost deep in the canyon, and her afternoon hunting trip is about to turn into a life-threatening ordeal. Hunter Michelle Heilman is lost deep in a hazardous canyon. Her father Benny's concern is verging on a nightmare. I gave her an hour, about an hour and a half, and then I went down the uh, the fence line looking for her. I didn't find her or any sign of her. I took the pickup and drove the roads all around the area looking for her, but no sign of her, no tracks, no nothing. I got very concerned, and I called the sheriff's office, sheriff's office and uh, requested search and rescue. The rescue team arrives and begins an all-out search. I don't know. I can't find. I showed them the tracks. Uh, they marked that area, and they then uh, spread out and did what they called a grid search. To no avail, no tracks, no anything. 
Michelle calls up the survival techniques her father taught and builds a shelter for the night. When I made my decision to stay right there that night, I was thinking that it was the safest spot and the safest thing to do right there. By the end of October, the weather can take violent turns without warning. But as Michelle prepares to face the dark, there is hope in the sound of a string of gunshots. I bedded down there, and I had heard uh, nine shots. And I thought, well, I'll fire three shots, and they'll know that I'm down here. And they'll know I'm all right. And I had fired three shots. And somebody had fired some more shots. And I thought, well, they're answering my shots. They know I'm OK. But the deep canyon walls muffle the sound of Michelle's rifle from the ears of her father and the rescue team. That first day, search and rescue looked way into the night. I probably didn't quit till almost midnight. And they stopped the search until daylight on Monday morning. At first confident in her survival skills, Michelle begins to grow unsure as she tallies the long list of fundamental mistakes she has made. I screwed up. I should have had my, my day pack and because I had a blanket in it. I had a parka, sandwiches, fire material, medication. I, I was ready if I would have had that. Michelle makes it through one night with only cold and discomfort. But ahead lies unforeseen disaster before the morning's done. Daylight, about 6.30, I could see. And I was up and going again. And I was making my way across the rocks. And, and I was walking on top of that, doing really well for my first 10 minutes, but I took a step. My leg disappeared into a hole. Excruciating pain. Everything in my mind was white. It was just pain. Michelle's hope of finding her way out has now been dealt a potentially fatal blow. The thought that came to mind was, I'm hurt. I don't know if I can get out of this. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out of this canyon without help. To Michelle's injury, add the appearance of a bear hunting for food. But these are just the start of a string of mounting dangers. Elk hunter Michelle Heilman has plunged off the trail into the deadly maze of a dark canyon. After an icy night, she now lies seriously injured. And somewhere near her, a bear is roaming, looking for food. I didn't want to be a predator's meal. Michelle suffered a freak accident. And when she at last examines her leg, she realizes she has sustained a severe trauma. Tree branches have punctured the back of her knee. And there was two sticks underneath the kneecap, and I had managed to pull those out. There was no real major bleeding of any sort. There's no alternative. Keep moving or die. I pulled myself up the bank and crawled several feet. I was in a lot of pain. Didn't know what I was going to do exactly. I had no first aid kit with me. There was nothing there to bandage it. In excruciating pain, Michelle must crawl her way upward, making agonizingly slow progress. It's now been two days frigid temperatures, and no food. I had a real dear friend that said that rose hips were good for you. And there was several rose bushes, wild rose bushes along the sides. And so I decided that I would pick the rose hips, and I would chew on those. And 
They weren't too bad, very seedy, but in a lot of ways, tastes like oranges. Then something else that I ate was uh, moss. Light moss makes you sick. Dark moss is palatable. <laughs> Measuring her progress in yards rather than miles, Michelle is still being shadowed by a bear. The bear was going up the hill the same time I was. He was foraging and looking for things to eat before he hibernated. Black bears attack and kill more people than do grizzlies. Luckily for Michelle, this one does not seem to have detected her. That was one of my fears, you know, if he got the smell of me or could smell my leg, it was an open wound. I was worried that he could take advantage of that and that put the fear into me. Michelle's desperate odyssey has now spanned days, but unknown to her, the force of volunteer searchers is only growing, giving her father hope. The search effort continued and seemed to grow every day. People brought extra horses on Wednesday. There were so many people looking and coming that they had to turn people away. Temperatures falling to 14 below take their relentless toll on Michelle's body. I had been crawling for several days and my feet got to the point where I couldn't feel them. And so for every step I took forward, it seemed like I was falling one step backwards. Incredibly, Michelle has survived for almost a week. When a passing helicopter fails to spot her, the suffering she is feeling begins to spread from her body to her mind and her spirit. On about the seventh day, my body was shutting down. It just didn't feel right. My mind wasn't as crisp and clear as I thought it should be. And I was thinking, you know, this is, this is getting close to the end. If I don't get found, I'm going to freeze to death. Feeling she's nearing her end, Michelle prepares a final testament. I had my walking stick with me, and I decided that I was going to carve a message to my dad. And I think I wrote on, I'm sorry, dad, but it wasn't your fault. And then she suffers yet another fall. Michelle is failing fast. All she has left is her faith and perhaps divine intervention. <laughs> Michelle Heilman's October elk hunt in Oregon has turned into a saga of incredible hardship. Lost, freezing, starving, and badly injured. How has she survived this long? It may be that help came from an angelic origin. On my third night, I was in a lot of pain, and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get through it alone. And I had asked God for help. I said, it's cold, I need warmth. There's just no way that I can get through this alone. I went to sleep, and I slept fairly sound, and I was warm. And I woke up, and there was this personage beside me. And I looked at him, and I thought, wow, I'm warm. God's taken care of it. Michelle's father, Benny, feels time is slipping away for his daughter. Benny, we're gonna keep and he begins to think okay. the unthinkable. The possibility of her still being alive was slim. I knew it was coming, but it was heartbreaking because I felt that she was still alive. She's never been a person to give up on anything. The sheriff's office 
and the search and rescue people felt that it was time to, to go from search and rescue to recovery. Eight days and seven nights into the ordeal, the authorities are about to scale back the search to a skeleton crew. Benny takes to the radio and asks for volunteers to help him find his daughter. 350 neighbors and complete strangers respond. Somewhere in the dark canyon that the elk drew her down into, Michelle is losing her fight to live. Then, a Heilman family friend, Will Lair, follows a hunch, or maybe it's a direction from something beyond. He and Marilyn Seaford search in McAllister Creek Canyon. Deep in the canyon, he hears moaning. At first, he thinks it's a bear. The next thing I knew, I was shouting uh, Michelle's name. It just came out of me. And about as fast as I was surprised that that took place, Michelle answers me over here. I couldn't believe my ears. I just started going through that creek bottom, through the thick brush, hollering back, you know, where you at? I'm coming for you. And finally, I could see her. I got a visual, and finally, I made my way to her. And uh, she was just as calm and peaceful as can be. I had crawled down to the creek to uh, get breakfast, as I called it. My water and uh, my uh, rose hips along the way. And I heard somebody say, Michelle! And it was so strange not hearing anybody. I said, yeah, what do you want? And it was dead silent. Is that you, Michelle? Michelle, is that you? Yes. Yeah. Where, Where are, are you? you? I'm having breakfast. <laughs> Sunday morning, we put everybody in that canyon. Michelle. About 9.30 in the morning. He found her. Called me on the radio and he said, Benny, she's alive. Benny, Benny, it's Bill. I found her and she's in the bottom of the canyon. Benny fights his way down into the canyon to find his daughter, miraculously alive. When my father came in to the draw, the first thing I said to him is, what took you so long? I'm right beside the fence, and I'm sorry I crossed the road. And he said, do I have to get an elk out of here? Drag an elk out of here? And I said, no, you don't have to get an elk. And he was asking me, he says, do you think you can get up and walk? Or can you get up and walk? And I said, no, nope, can't do that. Feet are froze solid. Airlifted to safety, Michelle's ordeal is far from over. At the hospital, the pain of thawing her frostbitten flesh is excruciating. And the final verdict is heart-wrenching. Both her lower legs must be amputated. They saved both of my knees and four inches below the knees on both legs. I'm very blessed. I can walk. The loss of her limbs has really not changed Michelle in spirit or any way that she was. She still wants to hunt. She still wants to fish. I think I have adjusted very well. I'm trying to do everything that I did before. I still go fishing, still go hunting. Michelle Heilman's agonizing ordeal has led to insight for her and for her father. I think after this incident happened with Michelle, it has made me realize just how precious each day is. Tomorrow is not for certain, 
you don't take life for granted. Enjoy today. Enjoy everything that is around you today. You don't know what's going to come tomorrow. Hi, I'm Craig DiMartino. I love being outside. The rock climbing is my passion. Even though that passion resulted in the loss of one of my legs a few years ago, there's still no sport I find as challenging and fun that I'd rather be doing. Fly fishing is Dean Ryrie's passion, but casting out a line one summer afternoon nearly cost him his life. This is no fish tale, but a chilling story of one man's faith and perhaps even a miracle. Since Dean Ryrie was a kid, he's loved the outdoors. From the rush of skiing to the tranquility of fly fishing. My father taught me how to use a fly rod when I was a teenager, and I just developed a real passion for it. If the trout are running, Dean's got a line out there. Fishing's my second religion. Growing up, there's two things you can do on Sunday. One of them was go to church, and the other one was fly fish. Does that promise to give him more hours? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dean lives with his wife and kids just outside Salt Lake City, Utah. Not far away is Little Cottonwood Canyon, home to some of the best outdoor recreation in the country. July 28, 2008 was a typical summer day. As he had done many times before, Dean made the spur of the moment decision to spend the afternoon fishing. I have a good spot near Tanner Flats on Little Cottonwood Creek. And uh, the fishing really seems to get good in the evening and I'd get there just in time to catch what I wanted to and, and home before dark. Which was good. And have a little fish fry with my daughter. <laughs> Dean drove 30 minutes up the canyon and parked near Tanner's Flat campground. Dean knew there was no reception in the canyon, so he left his cell phone in the truck. He would usually call and let me know I'm gonna head out fishing and would usually tell me where he's going. It just happened to be on this particular day he had not. Dean hiked through rugged brush to reach the area he wanted to fish. He had hooked some nice sized rainbow trout there before. There was fresh snow runoff coming from both sides of the canyon, so there was a lot of rushing water coming through. The creek temperature's quite, quite low. <laughs> when he arrived at the creek, he noted the current. Even in summer, the river's water temperature can be an icy 45 degrees. The creek is also a watershed, so waders are mandatory. He put his on, but didn't head into the middle of the river. Instead, Dean set up his gear on a large rock near shore. I saw a promising spot across the creek and cast it into it and immediately had a hit. But because he was standing high on the rock and not in the water, Dean worried he'd lose the fish when he reeled it in. So he decided to move in closer. I moved off of that big rock onto a smaller one that was just barely submerged. It twisted to the side and slapped me right into the water hard. A split second later, Dean was completely submerged. I was crawling on the creek bed, thinking that this rock's gonna roll over, I'm gonna drown. And I was thinking, this is the end. Your life flashes before you, all the things they say. I didn't want to go out like that. Dean clawed at the bottom of the creek. I wasn't sure I was going to make it, but I twisted just right and popped up. Happy to be alive. His happiness quickly faded. The rock that shifted was actually a two-ton boulder and it had an ironclad grasp on Dean's right foot. I was completely stuck. That's when I realized how big the rock was. It wasn't moving. Chest deep in the bitterly cold water, Dean's next realization was all the more alarming. I started feeling the cold immediately. My waders were completely ripped. He was now at risk of becoming hypothermic in the freezing water, and his body temperature began to drop rapidly. It's fresh runoff from ski resorts. That water's cold. As the severity of his situation sunk in, Dean saw he wasn't the only one trapped. Hey, there's still a fish there. I looked at the fish and I said, at least one of us is gonna live through this. I'm not sure it's gonna be me, so I'm gonna let you go. And I said goodbye to him. 
I was scared. I was truly scared at that point. Ah! It was still not dark, so I started yelling for help in the hope that somebody would come close enough on the trail to hear me. Ah! There was a campground nearby, so maybe, just maybe. I just kept yelling. But his cries, no match for the rushing water, were immediately drowned out. And nobody came. It was an innocent hop from one rock to the next, but Dean Ryrie slipped. Now his right foot was trapped by a two-ton boulder, holding him down in icy ah! creek water. All he could do was scream for help, hoping someone would find him before he froze to death. When I got to thinking about how dire my situation was, I just told my Heavenly Father, that, hey, don't let me go out this way. Dean desperately attempted to stave off the cold. I took my vest off, laid it on the rock, hoping it would dry enough to keep me warm enough to survive until somebody found me. When it started getting dark, I, I knew it was time to hunker in for the night, but I, I continued to yell. Ah! I continued to pray that the Lord would preserve me to see my family again, tell my wife that I love her, and hold my kids in my arms. Back at his home, his wife was beginning to wonder where he was. I started to worry, but then I thought, no, he'll be okay. He, you know, he knows what he's doing. And a lot of times he'll fish until late because that tends to be when the fish are a little bit more active. And it wasn't until after midnight that I really started to get worried. I had tried calling Dean on his cell phone several times, and I was not getting any answer at all. While Tracy tried to reach her husband, Dean continued to cry out for help. Oh! I kept yelling. Oh! I kept yelling. I kept yelling. Oh, Still nothing happened. You can't believe the power this water has. Craig DiMartino lived through his own terrifying trauma. He wanted to hear how Dean dealt with the feeling of helplessness, cold, and the hours alone. It gets dark, right? You're, you, you've, you've settled in. Now what? What are you feeling well, about? In that water, a lot of people say, boy, that must have been the longest night of your life. It had to be. And you know what? It, it wasn't. It was the shortest night of my life. It really was. I started fearing, and that's when I, I turned to my faith and started to pray. I, I felt the presence of my ancestors who had passed on uh, there beside me, strengthening me. And I wasn't alone. Oh, yeah. There's nothing like that feeling, and I felt that. Uh, I felt my mother's arms around me. And I felt the presence of my grandfather. I thought a, a lot about past experiences with him, and I know they placed those, those memories in my mind at that time to comfort me. That feeling was with me so strong. All I knew was that the Lord answered my prayer. He sent angels to lift me up. And those angels were my family. I, I just knew I was going to make it. I didn't realize how bad the situation was still. And I'm glad I didn't because it got me through the night. Dean's spirits were lifted by memories of his family. But back at his house, Dean's wife was now extremely anxious. Tracy could no longer simply stare at the clock and hope that Dean would walk through the door. She and her son decided to go look for him. Okay, you look on that side and I'll look on this side. Okay. Which meant driving to all of Dean's favorite fishing spots. He'd been fishing at several different canyons, so when it came time to look for him, it was a bit of a challenge. How the spots up here? We headed all the way up one of the canyons and all the way back down and did not find his vehicle. Where else could he have gone? Waiting, wondering where he was at, it just seemed like a night that took forever. It had been nearly eight hours since Dean's ordeal began. His body temperature had dropped to a point where others would be dead already. How much longer could he possibly hold on? 
Fisherman Dean Ryrie was just trying to jump from one rock to another when he ended up trapped by a boulder in an icy creek. 14 hours later, he was barely clinging to life. It had just finished a little rain that had fallen and I started feeling really cold again. And I didn't really feel the presence of my family nearly as much. Gathering what strength he had left, ah! Dean called out for help again. As the sun came up, Tracy continued her search, this time driving up to Tanner's flat campground. That's where I found our truck sitting there. And then I knew something was wrong. Right about that time, a father and his young son, who were camping at Tanner Flats, decided to hike down by the river. As I continued to yell, help, somebody please help me, this little angel appeared on the side of the creek. Are you okay? And that's all I can describe him as, and I was so happy to see him. So he ran off. I thought, oh boy, hope he gets back quick. <laughs> And he came back with his dad, and I had my arms tucked in like I had been. His dad looked at me and says, oh, you got a broken arm? I said, no, but my foot's stuck between these two boulders, and I've been here all night. And this guy's just face just went white. The father immediately took off to find a phone and called 911. 911, what is the address of your emergency? Uh, yeah, Tanner's flat, and the male has his foot stuck between two rocks. Not sure what they were going to find, rescue workers raced to the scene. Police and ambulances came flying out the um, road into the campground. I didn't know what was going on. Tracy feared the worst. Soon she found out that the commotion was a desperate attempt to rescue Dean. One of the first responders was Jake Harmer, a 10-year veteran paramedic with the Unified Fire Authority of Greater Salt Lake. The only details we had is that we had someone stuck in the river, and we knew that it could be quite a perilous situation. During the time of year that it was, the river is extremely high. The only way to get in to see him was to be in the water with him. As I went into the water, my first thought was, wow, this water is really cold. The first person that I saw face to face was Jake Harmer. Okay, let's see if I can help you out. Okay, yeah, let's see if you can move. Jake has a, a real sp special spirit about him. It's stuck in there pretty good. Is that your foot? Yeah, yeah. And we're going to need a lot of help to set up all the technical aspects of a swift water rescue. Yeah. hot blankets and compresses and vests on me and my spirit sword. I thought, well, it's only a matter of time. Okay, I need a full set of vitals with the temperature, okay? Okay, I'm going to take the temperature. Stand up, all right? When we took Dean's body temperature, we took it tympanically in his ear. It read 63. It's really cold. Do you need a warm fluid? I thought for sure that our equipment was incorrect. Everybody's told me, nobody's ever conscious of that. That's the temperature of a corpse, man. He brings an IV, and I said, you put an IV? Can't we just get me out first? Well, we might not get you out for a while. It doesn't look easy. I realized that if we didn't get him out quickly, I could lose him altogether. More rescue workers arrived. By now, Dean was exhibiting symptoms of extreme hypothermia. Initially, we tried to move the rock ourselves. That wasn't happening at all. Dean watched helplessly as additional efforts to move the massive boulder failed. I did kind of start thinking that they're running out of options. Okay. 
We were in worse shape than I had initially thought. At that point, I didn't know how much longer he could be conscious. First responders and survivors often share a special connection. Dean and Craig both know what it's like when someone holds your life in their hands. When they got in the creek with you, was it relief? Jake was awesome. He was very composed, but there's so many uh, Sheriff's Department and Fire Department. They wouldn't even let my wife get close to me because there's too much that the other guys were doing. That's and terrifying. You got a lot of people for one guy. That That's heavy. They're in the river now. Where yeah, you just been? I'm watching them spell each other off every 10, 15 minutes because they were getting too cold. Right. But Dean was the one in real danger. Jake knew that Dean's only hope was the department's heavy rescue equipment. At the time, they hadn't arrived yet. And I was starting to get worried that it was taking far too long. Finally, the heavy rescue specialists arrived. Jake told me that they were going to use the Kevlar airbags. I'd never heard of them before. These are the type of airbags that we use in heavy rescue situations such as structural collapse, moving large cement slabs. We thought that if we could get one underneath the rock, then we could lift it just enough to free his foot. Dean had been standing in the river for almost 17 hours. This was a last ditch effort. If this didn't work, I had nothing I could do to help him and I would watch him die. It had been over an hour since first responders reached Dean Ryrie. But the fisherman's foot was still trapped, and his body temperature was down to an unbelievable and deadly 63 degrees. Rescue workers devised a plan to free Dean using Kevlar airbags, normally used after structural collapses. We thought, this is our last chance. I could see some urgency in some of the faces. Some of the other guys were scurrying around, pretty nervous. If this didn't work, we were at, at the end. I really didn't want to see Dean Parrish right there with me. So we started inflating, and as we pulled on him, pop, I'm out. I didn't feel any water rushing past me anymore. What a feeling, but it didn't last long because my foot started hurting really bad. As blood rushed back into Dean's foot, he experienced blinding pain. Just because he was out of the river did not mean he was out of the woods. Whenever you have a crush injury like this, you have so much damage, it could send his heart into arrhythmias and we could still lose him. We had an army of people there ready to take him out to his ride to the hospital. A waiting helicopter rushed Dean to Intermountain Medical Center. At that point, I realized how exactly cold I was. I had only been in the water for perhaps 45 minutes, and it was almost unthinkable for me to imagine surviving being in that water for 16 hours. Dean woke up in the ICU. After being treated for advanced hypothermia, he was finally reunited with his family. When we were able to finally see Dean in the hospital, he was just upset with himself. I'm sorry this happened. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They had been looking for me all night. I didn't know that until that point, because I didn't tell anybody where I was going, which is stupid. <laughs> Though they were able to save Dean's life, doctors were not sure they could save his injured foot. Because his foot was so swollen, they take the scalpel and they make little marks all over it. Just allow it to be able to swell and it, it wasn't, it wasn't a good sight. Everybody kept giving me prosthetics are so good these days. <laughs> Trying to really pump me up and then of course my reaction was, get me into a ski boot. I can't live without skiing, I just can't. Again, Dean amazed everyone. Though he lost seven of the nine extender tendons in his right foot, doctors were able to save it. The water temperature, which just about killed me, is probably the reason I have a foot. It preserved 
the tissue to the point where what did survive, survived well. After his harrowing ordeal, Dean spent 10 days in the hospital. The guys at the sheriff's department told me that the time that they've done any rescues, ever had anybody survive, they gone to that temperature. It takes a special type of person to overcome and endure such amazing and unreal circumstances. And I think Dean is one of those special people that just had it in his will that he would not die. Once he returned home, Dean went through extensive rehabilitation. Today, he's still able to fish and ski as often as he likes, which is good because Dean's passion for the outdoors has not changed and neither has his passion for life. I can't go through a day without looking up and saying thanks for life. Air is a gift. <laughs> Dean's peace of mind saved his life. His body went into shock and hypothermia, but he never let panic set in. Dean never lost faith, and even felt the presence of his family there with him in the river. Sometimes faith, determination, and the human mind can overcome things the body can't. I know this from my own survival experience, and now so does Dean, having walked through his own fight to survive. Best friends out for a day's fishing. Then disaster. Hey, 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 Marine 16. Hey, hey. Come on, bro. Gotta get off this thing. It's going down. Plunging into a watery hell. Just intensely cold. They brave two days in frigid waters that should kill them in hours. We need to get somewhere. Hypothermia is gonna kill you and me both. Okay. As body temperatures plummet, they face the ultimate decision. Did you just give me the strength? This was probably the hardest decision I'd ever made in my life. Might be able to catch up on some redfish. Oh, that'd be good. The second day of spring, 2012. Best friends Ed Cohen and Ken Henderson set out for two days of Texas Gulf fishing on Ken's Sport Fisher. Their friendship and will to live will soon be tested by disaster and tragedy. Ed was the best friend you could really ever have. My wife would always call him her other husband, you know, because she's she's known him, you know, for I guess about 15 years now, as long as she's known me. It didn't matter if they were hunting, fishing, vacationing, um, just getting on the motorcycles and taking off. They were just inseparable. We've made uh, hunting trips to South Texas, fished in a spring-fed lake, and caught just tons and tons of uh, largemouth bass, just catch and release, just having a good old time. Uh, we've been on ram hunts together. He's uh, he's a fairly good shot too. He, uh, in fact, he killed his ram with a 45 automatic pistol. Today, they've plotted a course to one of their favorite fishing spots, the oil rigs off Matagorda, Texas. Ken's just bought a 30-foot sport fisher. Although the boat's used, Ken's a boat safety instructor, swift water rescue expert, and master diver. So he's made sure the craft is sound and fully equipped. We got everything working right. It had a brand new Icon marine radio in it, top of the line reef marine radio, side scan sonar with uh, GPS. Went ahead and bought some extra safety equipment. I bought an extra five life jackets besides the seven I already had on board. I had flares, charts, um, everything, the bellows, whistles, lights. I had everything in a 50 caliber ammo can that I kept stored in the bow of the boat. And it was waterproof. And of course, if you know anything ever happened, it would float. Feeling prepared for anything, they set off south at 7.30 in the morning, heading for the Gulf's oil and gas rigs. We were both like a couple kids that morning. We were excited, getting ready to go fishing the first time since uh, December. It had been four months since we hadn't been able to go fishing because of the weather. I called my wife Sandy on the phone, and I told her, I said, look, we're going to head a little farther out. I won't have any cell service out there, but I'll give you a call when I come in this evening. You know, we were in no big hurry. Our, our big deal was just being out there and hanging around together and talking. We got 70 feet of water, man. This ought to be good. Water they find a likely spot water, at a deserted platform nice. and drop their lines. I hope we do like we did last time. 
get some bulls out of here. Trees are full. Suddenly, they see something's gone seriously wrong. We're just shooting the bull, and he looked in the back. He goes, hey, I think we'll turn them bilge pumps on. I said, what do you mean? I looked back, and I was like, oh, my god. For some reason, they're taking on water, and the bilge pumps can't handle the sudden flood. We got to get out of here, brother. All right, let's go. Ken is a former law enforcement officer, and both are Marine veterans. They're used to facing emergency situations. And this is now a dire emergency. Where's the water coming from? I said, hey, we got to go in. And I said, we need to get this boat running, see if we can get some, some hydraulic action, see if we can get this water vacuumed out of this boat. We got about 100 yards from the rig we were tied to, and one of the motors died. It's like, well, we're going to have to limp in on one engine. I'm fixing, to, I'm fixing to go ahead and put out a mayday, and, and we're still moving. Ken's boat is foundering with hundreds of gallons of seawater in the hull and more pouring in. Then the second motor dies, leaving them dead in the water. I got on my cell phone. I hit 911. I got uh, no signal too far out. Picked up the marine radio and I made a made a marine 16 made a and I got no response because all I was going to do was blurt out our location and you know until a vessel in distress vessel going down. Ken Henderson and Ed Cohen are sinking fast. Mayday, Mayday, Marine 16, Mayday. An offshore catastrophe leaves fishing buddies Ken Henderson and Ed Cohen scrambling in what would become an epic fight for survival. I say, get the life jackets out. I put it on, buckled it one time. Mayday, Mayday, that's on this We're going down. I'm still hollering on the radio for help. Come on, brother. It's going down. Come on, brother. We got the boat is listing badly to starboard, and water is rushing over the transom. And Ed said, we got to go. We got to get off this thing. It's going down. It's going to roll over. Go. I said, go, go, get in the water. So he, he jumped in. Um, I was standing on the Mayday. driver's seat. I let go, and just as I let go, the boat kind of violently popped straight up and threw me off. You all right? The boat just dropped straight down. There was about eight feet of the bow sticking out. And we both kind of looked at each other in amazement. We were just like, what just happened? This boat just sunk from underneath us in five minutes. From the first time I looked at my watch until we were in the water was less than five minutes. We didn't have time to react as soon as that water hit you in the head, see spots, and it was, it was just intensely cold. Ken's instincts tell him the abandoned rig is their best bet for a safe haven. And I started to swim, and I looked back, and Ed wasn't, Ed wasn't coming, and I had got about 100 yards from him. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not going if he's not going. The vital emergency gear Ken had so conscientiously packed onto the boat is now trapped inside it and beyond their reach. When it went down, it took everything with it. it when the boat turned up, it all floated up inside the cabin. So we didn't have our, our flares, we didn't have our whistles, our horns, our flashlight. That was everything we needed to get rescued with. Adrift in a hostile sea, Ken and Ed only have life jackets and a half-filled bottle of Diet Cola. The relentless current is sweeping them away from the oil rig. As a master diver trained in survival techniques, Ken straps himself to Ed and puts more life jackets on them for added flotation. And I actually put it over his head and put it on over the top of his other one. I said, is that better, keeping your head up out of the water? Does that make you feel better? Oh, much better. OK. They are potentially just hours away from unconsciousness and death in the frigid Gulf waters, when they sight a glimmer of hope in the shape of another oil rig in the distance. Ken wants them to swim towards the rig. And he said, no, no, I think we need to save our energy. I said, oh, we need to get somewhere. Hypothermia is going to kill you and me both. He says, no, somebody will come along. They'll, they'll get it. I said, OK, all right, we'll hang tight. It has now been six hours in the water, and night is closing in. The men begin to fear for their survival. 
But there's a source of hope. Ken's wife, Sandy, is a 911 dispatcher. He's confident she'll spring into action. Basically, I got mad eventually because I hadn't heard from him, and that was very unusual. I probably stayed up until 1 o'clock in the morning just waiting on the phone to ring, and it, of course, never did. The frigid March night goes on, and the two friends have only the warmth of words. We talked during the night. We talked about a lot of things. We talked about family. We talked about how much we loved each other. We prayed together. We prayed. We kind of put our heads together, and uh, we'd pray silently. And um, I, I started out asking for rescue. I even prayed for a dolphin to come by and give me a ride to a rig or something. He all he all he kept saying was, "I just want to get home and kiss my babies. I just want to get home and kiss my babies." Fatigue and hypothermia are taking their toll, but they find a way to get some warmth and some rest. During the night, we would take turns grabbing each other by our life jackets and pulling pulling each other up on top of us, and then we'd wrap our legs around it and kind of get a little bit. Of, even though there's this much life jackets between us, we could get some a little bit of radiant body heat and share it a little bit. And the only time you could really sleep is when you were on top of the other person. Next morning, you couldn't even work up a couldn't even work up a spit. It was getting hard to talk. Our jaws were both sore from our teeth chattering, and our muscles hurt from from just violently shaking from the cold. Without food or fresh water for almost 20 hours, they can only share sips of the diet cola. Now, the sign of advancing hypothermia. Ed begins to hallucinate. I looked over and he pulled out a big lighter and said, what are you gonna do, just light a signal flare or something? I said, no, I'm gonna light this cigarette. He said, I got one dry cigarette. I said, where? He goes, right here in my mouth. I said, brother, you ain't got a cigarette in your mouth. And he reaches up and he kinda, and you can just see the disappointment roll over his face because he's like, man, I'm, I'm hallucinating. The two men's torments stretch into the afternoon of the second day, and after 24 hours in the sea, Ken begins to hallucinate too. Ken and Ed are swiftly sinking into delirium, despair, and certain death. Mayday, Marine 16, Mayday! 27 hours ago, Ken Henderson and Ed Cohen's sport fishing boat slid beneath the waters of the Texas Gulf. The ocean temperatures are dragging them mercilessly into hypothermia. Then, a glimmer of hope. A helicopter passes overhead. It's heading for a gas rig only miles away. I realized that we were, we were drifting by the rig, kind of catty corner, and if we swam across current, we might be able to, you know, let the current slingshot us into the rig. The current will carry Ken us. encourages his carry friend to swim rig. towards the rig, but Ed's okay. body okay. is failing. Right he was mumbling and shaking, and, and we'd be having a conversation. He'd close his eyes, and I'd kind of shake him, and he'd, he, he'd wake up, what, well, I'm listening, I'm listening. Ken feels it's urgent that they swim to the rig. Ed, who's now critically hypothermic, doesn't have the strength. Ken unclips the tether that attaches them. I said, Ed, you're gonna have to help me here. He says, I can't, I just, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I just can't do, I can't move, I can't do anything. Ken doesn't want to leave his friend, but he makes the ultimate survival decision. And I said, all right, I said, look, here's, here's the deal. I said, I'm gonna have to go for help. I'm gonna have to try to make that rig and and I wrestled with that decision in, inside, thinking, you know, well, if I miss the rig, we'll both die out here. If I make the rig, then at least I can get Ed some help. He said, I understand. Make sure the first one back on shore gets to kiss them babies for me. Be sure to kiss them babies for me. And I said, all right, buddy, I'm out of here. I'm going for help. And he goes, all right. I said, I'll see you in a little bit. I will see you in a little bit. I shook him and told him that. I love you, brother. All right. I took off and um, I, I started to swim for that rig and uh, I started to, you know, 
cry a little bit knowing that this was probably the hardest decision I'd ever made in my life is leaving my best friend of 20 something years alone, not leaving him out there to perish in the ocean, but leaving him alone in the ocean. I swam uh, about 20 yards. I looked over my shoulder and I saw Ed one time rise in the waves. You could see him take his hand and wipe the water out of his face because the waves are still breaking on us. It's still ice cold. And, and then when I went about another 20 yards, I stopped, turned around. I couldn't see him anymore. Ken swims as hard as he can, knowing that two lives now ride on him. But he's no match for the current and is swept past the rig and farther into the bone-chilling gulf. I finally resolved myself that this was it, that uh, I was just going to have to float here and hope that somebody would find me and then I could get back and they could find Ed or they could find Ed and they could get to me or whatever. Along with his delirium and dehydration, Ken now has to deal with the pain of self-doubt. The cardinal sin, I left a, I left a brother behind, and you just, you'd never do that. Um, I, just, I was just so disappointed in my decision-making at that point. Totally depleted by this futile swim, Ken passes out from exhaustion. When Ken awakens from semi-coma, it is night. He's survived 30 hours in gulf waters that should have killed him a day ago. Exhausted and delirious, Ken can barely believe it when he sees a shining light of hope. When I rose up, I saw a lit rig in the distance up there, and I guessed it to be about four or five miles away. And I followed up to a star, and I said, okay, that star right there. So I, I, I started swimming. I stopped for a few minutes when the cramps in my legs and my arms got so bad. Um, and I stopped and prayed. I prayed for the strength. That's all I wanted. I said, Lord, just give me the strength to get Ed help. And, and I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not asking for much. I just give me, give me a, a foot in the backside to keep going. I don't, I can't give up, I can't quit. Ken's hypothermia has reached a critical stage, and time is running out. For seven more hours, he struggles towards the rig, praying for his life and the survival of his best friend. Ken Henderson is desperately swimming towards a gas rig, hoping to save his life and the life of his best friend, Ed Cohen. The seven-hour swim has cost him the last of his strength, but finally, he reaches the platform. He spots a ladder inside the structure. I actually, I, I pulled with all my strength and got my legs up on the bottom rung, but when I stood up, it was like I wasn't standing up. Uh, it was, it was weird. I, I just, I couldn't feel my legs very well. He climbs aboard and wanders into the rig's galley. The crew is asleep, but Ken finds food, water, and miraculously a telephone. Turned around and looked and there was a cordless phone on a charger. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm hallucinating. There's no cordless phone on an oil rig. I went over, picked it up, and got a dial tone, and I called my home phone number. Sandy answers, and it's a voice she's been desperate to hear. He was so hoarse that you couldn't hardly understand, you know, anything that he had to say. And he said, I don't have but a minute, but I'm on an oil rig, and Ed is still out there. And he was telling me what rig number he was on. Sandy immediately phones the Coast Guard and gives them the platform's number. The Coast Guard fixes the location. Incredibly, Ken is 54 miles from where his boat went down. Ken tries to warm up and prays for good news about Ed. The next morning, he's transported to a Coast Guard station and aids in their search. Well, this is where we have you picked up at. Uh, you want to go over here? I was pointing at rigs on charts and everything else, and I heard the Marine 16 radio uh, in the background, and I, 
I heard that um, somebody would say that they had, uh, they had, the fishermen had found um, what they believed to be Ed's body floating in the water. Ed's pulse is weak, and Ken is rushed to the hospital. But it didn't look good. And I had pretty much resigned myself to the fact that, you know, that it, it was, you know, kind of a, a shot of hope, but it was a shot of hope. And the lady came out and she said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Cohen didn't, he didn't survive. And um, I, you know, kind of, kind of wilted. I kind of fell out, really. Um, and I, once I got my thoughts together, I said, take me to him. And she said, are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm positive. Take me to him. I uncovered his head and, and talked to him for a minute and apologized to him and that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get him some help quicker. And then I, I promised him that I would, you know, do what he asked me to do and take care of the girls the way I've always, he's always told me that he wanted me to. Ed is gone. The doctors now focus on Ken's condition and insist on immediate hospitalization. I got on the road and probably broke every speed limit between Conroe and Matagorda. Just such a relief to see his face for that first time. So I stayed in the room with him and slept in the bed with him. And, you know, there was a lot of teary moments where he still had a lot going through his mind. Everything that had gone on, it finally hit me. And um, I knew that I was going to have to go back and explain to those three babies and two grandbabies that I took their daddy fishing and didn't bring him home. First one back. Be sure to get some babies for me. After three days, Ken is released. He knows there is one more thing to do for Ed. And then his phone rings. It was Ashley, the oldest daughter. Uh, Uncle Ken, are you home? I said, yes, baby, I'm home. Can we come see you? I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep you from it. All three of the girls, they all came over, and they were, you know, when they saw me, they, you know, they, they started, they got upset, and they were crying. And, and, and I, um, I gave them all, we all got in a big circle, and I hugged, and, and you know, and I told them, I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I wish I could have, you know, brought, the, brought your daddy home, but, um, and, and Ashley's like, you know, Daddy was doing what he loved to do with the person he loved to do it with, and he probably wouldn't have had it any other way. And I said, well, y'all line up. And they said, what for? I said, I'm going to make a promise to your Daddy. And I lined all three of them up and gave them all a big kiss. I said, that's from your Daddy. And I said, that was the last thing he told me. Craig DiMartino. Some say that hunting and fishing in Alaska is the best in the world. Definitely some of the most challenging. Two friends left this harbor in Ketchikan headed to the Misty Fjords region of southern Alaska. They were on a hunt for moose and grizzly. What they found tested the very limits of a man's ability to survive the wild. Survival in Alaska is all about taming the extremes. The brutal weather, the predatory wildlife, the severe terrain, each could easily kill anyone unprepared for the challenge. But it's those same dramatic qualities that make Alaska such an attraction for outdoorsmen. That's exactly what hooked 51-year-old Adrian Knops on his first trip to Alaska from Michigan nearly six years ago. I just couldn't get enough of the wildlife, the scenery, the, the mountains. The first trip was an eye-opener for me. And it kind of got it in my blood where I fell in love with it. You just love to be here. Is, is the feeling that you get. Adrian had traveled to join his friend, an Alaskan native, Garrett Hagen, for some fishing and hunting. They had met in Michigan, where Garrett's stories intrigued Adrian. He loved to talk about his life of fishing and hunting in Alaska, and who doesn't want to hear that who's an outdoors person? Anything out here? Any moment now. No? Okay. <laughs> Garrett's father fished for a living, and Garrett practically grew up on his dad's boat. I knew he was going to be a fisherman. 
we're a fishing family. I'm a commercial fisherman. He would fish with me all day long, work hard, and then at nighttime we'd anchor up. He'd put a line over the side and see what he could pull up off the bottom. He just had to know what was on the bottom, where he was at. Garrett had bought his own boat, a 50-footer named Abundance. He took a real interest in his boat. It was something he really liked. I think it meant it could probably maybe someday start a family and live on the boat even. Season after season, Garrett and Adrian managed to get together, either in Michigan or in Alaska, for a couple weeks of hunting or fishing. I can honestly say that Garrett was my best friend. In the fall of 2013, Adrian flew up to Ketchikan, Alaska. This trip, he and Garrett were going on a moose hunt. I had never seen the Misty Fjords, and uh, Garrett had never seen the Misty Fjords, and he was very excited about this trip. Garrett and his dad prepped the abundance. The plan was to leave Ketchikan on Friday, September 13th. Don't be careful. Don't get a big moose. Will do, yeah. See you when you get back. Yeah. Wish I was going with you. Garrett told his family not to expect them back until the following Sunday. See you in about a week. September 22nd. He was all excited. And the last thing I remember seeing my boy as he was heading out the bay, he gave me a wave and I gave him a wave. Have a good trip. And I seen him sitting at the steering wheel, just standing there looking ahead. Goodbye, you know. We left Ketchikan and, and headed south. We were going to spend two days, the Friday and Saturday, exploring the fjords as we worked our way up toward the Chickaman River. I pretty much stood on the bow of his boat or on the back all day long in awe of the Misty Fjords. I mean, they're just, they're almost straight vertical rock cliff. 1,000, 2,000 feet high, I don't know how high they are, but you feel very small looking up at them in that area. The next day, they reached the mouth of the Chickaman River and dropped anchor. Their plan was to go ashore in a small motorized skiff and scout the mud flats and tree line for signs of game. We didn't find any moose tracks but we weren't really up the river to where they would be anyway. So we figured we'd go back to the boat, have a good meal, get some sleep, make a plan, wake up, and continue on. The Chickaman River is fed by active glacier melt. The water is frigid and so thick with silt that you could hardly see a paddle blade just beneath the surface. When the tide rushed in, it raised the water level nearly 20 feet. On Sunday, the two set out from the Abundance, hoping to return that evening with some fresh game. Pretty nice day, huh? And you don't get much nicer day than this. All right, you're front grip, man. You've already got it. We motored that little skiff all the way up the Chickaman River. We got back in between the mountains, and we kept motoring up. And we were probably up into the mountain area a mile or two, and we noticed a little lagoon off the side of the river which generally indicates a stream entry. And so we pulled into there. Well, Garrett, this is just paradise up here. It's beautiful, isn't it? That is wonderful. So we got out and we made our way up through the brush and found the stream. And it opened up into the beautiful, typical Alaskan rocky stream trickling down the mountain. So we went in, we started scouting out. We found bear tracks, we found deer tracks, we found a lot of wolf tracks. That's a big bear. That's a big bear. Grizzlies in this part of Alaska can stand nine feet tall. And the wolves, they can sprint 40 feet in a second. The tracks told them both of these deadly predators were in the vicinity. We just waited up there for maybe upwards of an hour. Nothing really happened. And so we figured, hey, let's keep moving on. So we moseyed on back down the stream, walking out real slow. And we turned the last corner before going out to the boats. And they just started just bubbling over with, look at that. <laughs> He's pointing and really excited. And I, I came around the corner and looked, and there was this massive bear standing upright, facing us. 
whoa, and he, he pulls up to shoot it. And I, I was like, Garrett, don't do that. That's a grizzly bear. They were now face to face with one feeding on salmon. Out in the Alaska wilderness, it's said there is nothing more dangerous than interrupting a grizzly bear in the middle of a meal. And that's what Garrett was just about to do. In Alaska's remote rugged valleys of the Misty Fjords, Adrian Knops and his buddy Garrett Hagen had run right into a massive grizzly bear. Before it could charge, Garrett quickly aimed his rifle. So he raised up and he fired three shots. And the bear went down under the water, completely submerged. The wounded bear tried to stagger up to the bank. Garrett aimed again. Wait, don't shoot. Wait till it's out of water. But he shot. He was so excited. Another perfect shot. Nice shot. And that bear just, that was it. It was looking like this was going to be a very successful hunt. They were only three days into their 10-day trip, and already they had taken an impressive trophy. Think you're getting close. It took us hours to get that bear skinned and quartered and got all the meat off, because Garrett was the one, you don't waste meat. When you hunt, you eat the meat. And uh, so we had a lot of meat. After taking a break to eat the only meal they had packed, Ugh, we're almost there. they began the tedious chore of lugging the game bags full of meat down to their small skiff and kayak. This is heavy. We'll definitely make a couple more trips where we have to fill this thing up. You don't have to keep any bear meat in the fall in Alaska, but he was going to keep his meat. <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. Good to be young, Garrett. This is going to have to fill up both this and all of that. We weren't super picky. That's a lot of meat. But we still got 300 pounds of meat off that, that bear. You got this packed in here pretty well. We finally got the hide down to where the meat was, and we decided to, to pack all the meat and the hide in the kayak so that it wouldn't be in the little skiff we were in because that little skiff was rated for two guys and really nothing else. The current was surprisingly strong. The small overloaded kayak was at risk of capsizing. Yeah, Garrett, I, I don't like this. This is riding too low. The problem is that the water is like that far from over the top of the kayak. I think we need to transfer this into the skiff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we ended up putting most of the meat in the boat with us and just the hide stuffed down into the kayak. And that brought the kayak up more, made it much more stable, and we were good going down the river. The only problem with that is now we had 300 pounds more in, in the little skiff. And it brought the water up to where it was literally a couple inches from coming over the top. There was no way that the little skiff could take both men and 300 pounds of bear meat all the way down the river and then across the wide channel out to their anchored fishing boat. Boats are just riding too low. This is too much bear meat. I said, Garrett, we can't go out in the big water this way. He agreed. What do you say to this for a plan? We came up with the idea, hey, what if I I'll get out of the boat. With the guns, yeah. that'll lessen the weight in the boat, make it ride up higher. That's a great idea. Tie up to the boat, throw the meat on, tie the kayak off. We agreed that he wouldn't try to do anything with the hide. Just tie it up and leave it. You come back, go right back for me. Turn right around and get you. That sounds good. Yep, okay. we'll do that. And then we'd be at the boat. That was the plan. Um, now I wish we had made a different plan. Garrett dropped Adrian off at the edge of the wide mudflat. He held onto Garrett's two rifles to further lighten the loaded skiff. I'll be right back. Okay. Garrett motored off. Smile on his face. Great day, 60 degrees, no wind. Big bear in a boat, proud as can be, motoring off toward the boat. And it's a pretty vivid memory just watching him, watching him go. And everything was good. Adrian watched Garrett travel the half mile or so to the abundance, receding into a tiny speck on the horizon. He waited, but as the tide began to return and lap at his ankles, he grew concerned. After about a half an hour, uh, he's not coming back. So I pulled up one of the rifles and scoped the boat out to get a closer look. And there wasn't anything there. I couldn't see the skiffs and I couldn't see him. I couldn't see movement on the deck. And at that point, I knew that there was something wrong. But that was just one problem. 
Adrian was now stranded on the mudflat. The tide was coming in and it was getting dark. He had to head for safer ground, but in the heart of grizzly country, where would that be? A successful hunting day for two best friends had turned into a nightmare. Garrett was nowhere in sight, and Adrian was stranded without a boat or shelter in the Alaskan wilderness. I waited throughout the next half an hour. I kept scoping out the boat, trying to spot something. But I never spotted anything. There, there was no movement. I didn't see any boats, I didn't see him. No lights on deck, because it was starting to get dusk at the time. The boat was just there, anchored in the water, dead in the water, so. After about an hour, I knew he had died. I, I just knew that he was gone. Had the swift current taken down the skiff? Had Garrett fallen, loading the meat onto the boat? Adrian could only wonder. At that time, having a close relationship with my God, Jehovah, I just, I started praying at that moment. Oh, please, Jehovah, please pay attention to what is happening here. Just left it open. It was out loud all the time. I know that something has happened to Garrett. Like he was standing there with I me. I ask that your spirit watch over his situation. And, uh, I needed to keep calm. I know that you are looking on. Please give him the help that he needs. Which I did, it was almost surreal. Praying Jesus out loud made. helped Adrian to focus Amen. and to figure out his next move. Greg DiMartino went with Adrian back to that mud flat on the Chickaman River. to the spot where he last saw his friend. The abundance is, is there. Yeah, it's out there. Um, and that evening, he dropped me off out there in a little skiff before he went out to the abundance. I mean, do you still think about that? I can see it like it's happening right now. Yeah. I can see him taking his little boat and his new little motor and just putting along out there toward the abundance. And I waited for a half hour and then you'd come back in an hour, then I pretty much knew it was over, but it gave another hour and it was almost dark. I never got to see it. Um, but then the water was coming in around my feet and I had to move. The race was on to reach a downed tree before the water got too deep and swept him away. The tide's coming in and Throughout the tidal flat, there's these cuts that go through it. They make these little channels. And at low tide, there's no problem. But when the tide's coming in, they're filling up. Before I got up to the higher spot where I was headed, there was a big one, and the tide had come in enough to where I was wading up to my chest. Guns above my head. Going through this icy water. Finally made it up to this knoll, and to my relief, there was, on the top of it, there was an area of grass that was standing. And I'm like, oh, standing grass. No tides up here. Because there was some grass down below, but it was all matted down, like the water had been over it. So I said, this is where I'm gonna stay tonight. I mean, it was getting dark. But Adrian couldn't be sure that this incoming tide wouldn't inundate the tree. I sat up there and the tide was still coming in. Adrian saw the tide getting closer but there was no other place he could go. He was trapped. Luckily, it stopped not far from the tree and left him a little island of dry ground. And so I broke off some branches from other trees in the area, and got a little pile of firewood. In my little fanny pack, I carry three ways to start a fire. My preferred way is steel wool and a nine volt battery. It was probably the typical, beautiful, pristine, Alaskan clear night. Stars in the sky. 
But that heavenly spectacle wouldn't last long. Soon those stars disappeared behind heavy storm clouds. And that one fire and that one dry night on the Chickaman would be Adrian's last. Adrian Knops was stranded alone on a mudflat in a remote corner of southeast Alaska without any shelter and little food. Even worse, no one would be looking for Adrian or his hunting partner, Garrett, for at least a week. They had told their families that they would be out hunting for about 10 days. This was just the third day of their trip. That night, Adrian had a private memorial for his friend, which he shared with Craig. The first night you're here, and you made a memorial for Garrett. I was just going through every good thing I liked about Garrett. Allow me to tell all that can hear tonight that Garrett is your friend. He has served you faithfully all his life, and he is my best friend. Showed my appreciation for him the best I could. Made sure to ask God many, many times to remember him. What a wonderful young man he proved to be. And I beg that you remember him in the resurrection that your son Jesus talked about when he was here on earth. He was here on earth. I wanted the valley to hear. Maybe that's why the wolves stayed <laughs> away from here. I don't know. <laughs> and that brought me some comfort, a lot of comfort. I didn't have to concentrate on what just happened. Uh, it's not like I forgot it, obviously. Right, right. Um, it was a focus all the time, but it, it wasn't dominant. It didn't dominate me. And uh, yeah, I could move on. And after that time, as I started devising what I needed to do, you know. The next morning, Adrian took stock of his situation. And I started making plans, what I had to do. Uh, we had just started the hunt. The family was told we were gonna start at the Chickamauga River. We'd be back there for uh, over a week. And they weren't expecting us home until the next Sunday. And this was Sunday. So I knew I had to hold on for at least a week before they would even miss us. I told myself, this is possible. I looked in my, my little fanny pack and I had four oat bars. That was the only food I had. So I labeled them mentally. I said, there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I said, the last three days, I can get by three days with no food. The tide had receded, and Adrian took a walk to survey the boundaries of his solitary confinement. To one side, he was trapped by the wide, swift Chickaman River. On his other side, and behind him, dense trees, high cliffs, and predators. The tree line was full of wolf and bear tracks. And it's only about 20 yards of trees before it goes straight vertical cliff walls in that valley. So there's not much room for the animals, and if I went and inserted myself into their area, I'd just be fighting animals all night long. Adrian had no choice but to return to the isolated tree on the mudflat. I started going back before the tides came in, and it just started raining a little bit harder. It wasn't a mist anymore, it was a steady rain. That steady rain rapidly grew into a powerful, relentless storm. Temperatures plunged, and brutal weather battered Adrian. Lashed by high winds and driving rain, Adrian prayed for the strength to survive. But with each cycle, the tides rose and threatened to wash away Adrian's only refuge from the deadly cold waters. Stranded and alone on the most unforgiving terrain, and knowing no one was looking for him, Adrian knew he had to stay focused and use every resource within him to continue to survive. Find out how on the next Fight to Survive. Hi, I'm Craig DiMartino. This is one of Alaska's most remote areas. It was here on a hunting trip that Adrian Knops' friend, Garrett Hagen, disappeared. Now, alone on a marshy delta much like this one, Adrian is both physically and emotionally drained. But he doesn't want to die here. There is plenty that can kill a man out in the remote wilderness of Alaska. Grizzlies, wolves, swift river currents, frigid waters, and extreme weather. 51-year-old Adrian Knops was unfortunately all too familiar with the list. Just today, the third day into a hunting trip with his best friend, 
Adrian knew something terrible had happened to Garrett Hagen. That's fair. See the bet. Garrett had motored out to his fishing boat, the Abundance. It was anchored about a half mile away in the mouth of the Chickaman River. As Garrett neared the vessel, in the blink of an eye, he disappeared. After about an hour, I just knew that he was gone. The boat was just there, anchored in the water, dead in the water. Adrian's and Garrett's families didn't expect the two seasoned outdoorsmen home for another week. So nobody would come looking for them for at least seven more days. If I died and the tide swept me away, I knew that the families, Garrett's and mine, would think we were killed by wolves, bears. Adrian's deep concern for the families, for his own wife, two sons, and granddaughter back in Michigan, and for Garrett's family in Craig, Alaska, strengthened his will to survive. I cannot let these people think that that's what happened to us. I knew I had to get through that to tell the story. His first goal was to get off that mudflat. Adrian knew that in the Misty Fjords area of southeast Alaska, the icy tides rush in. He needed to find higher ground or he'd drown. The mudflat was bordered by steep vertical cliffs on one side and the Chickaman River on the other. A narrow tree line edged along the base of the cliffs. It's only about 20 yards of trees before it goes straight vertical cliff walls. The tree line was full of wolf and bear tracks. So the tree line was off limits, and the river on the other side was too wide, too swift, and too cold to swim across. He was stuck on that long, wide mudflat. His only option was a fallen tree. I would just use the root base of the tree as a windbreak. The bad part is when the tides came in after that first night, they came in high. And every night they got higher and higher. The tree trunk provided a solid windbreak and Adrian was able to build a small fire. But the tides kept growing, getting deeper and deeper around the tree. My dry spot became wet underwater. It came in so fast, it just picked the fire up, it was gone. Adrian took Craig DiMartino back to that fallen tree that gave him sanctuary from the fast rising water. There was my perch right there. So you get up here and there's a little place to stick half your butt and one shoulder into. But when I mean, the winds are really strong, see the wind, like even now in the breeze, it's coming through here like a funnel. Right. Hits me right in the side of the head. So you bunch up down like this and like this and you just sit. Rain continued into the next day, but the storm that had soaked the fire came with one silver lining. There was a pocket in the tree, just a little bowl. I couldn't get my hands or face in it, but I could cut a piece of dried marsh grass. I used it as a straw, and I drank out of that, the rainwater. When the low tide was out, I figured I needed to get some real water. So I hiked over to the mountains to the south. Off the rock walls with the rain, I mean, there's just cascades of fresh water. So I would just stay there for about a half an hour, and I would drink until I couldn't drink anymore. And then I'd walk back before the tide came in. Adrian ventured to the tree line during the short couple of hours during low tide, and only in daylight. Nighttime in those trees was far too dangerous. Every morning when I was there, I would look. You'd always see the wolf tracks. And when you get out into the sand, there is a pretty major bear trail. I figured, you know, this is covered by tide. Twice a day, I'm seeing these tracks. I cannot come to the trees for shelter. The day he and Garrett had come ashore, Adrian had brought with him four small snack bars. He still had those, and he still had Garrett's two hunting rifles. I thought about hunting for food, but without a fire, I asked myself, are you ready to eat whatever you shoot raw? And I'm like, 
signal. In case a passing aircraft happened to fly by, Adrian prepared a hasty signal. I would go down at low tide, and I went way out to the end, and I wrote an SOS. And then I drew a big arrow, and then walked up the sand, and maybe 100 yards, and then I drew another big sign, help, <laughs> another big arrow. So if a plane's flying there, they would fly right along the arrows, and I'd be standing at the end of them. For now, the giant tree provided safety from the life-threatening tides. I was basically trapped up on that perch. But less and less respite from the worsening weather. Stuck out in the open, he braced himself as a black sky crept across the horizon. Big black billowing clouds were just coming in over the mountains across the channel. Wow, that's a big storm. <laughs> And then it started to lightning. Electrical storms are rare for Alaska. Boom, boom, boom. Wow, that's pretty. But at the same time, you knew it was headed your way. And I'm standing in the middle of a, a, a tidal flat of a river. Exposed, nowhere to hide, Adrian was a perfect target for a lightning strike. I had a thought that I may not, may not get out of there. Perched on a fallen tree in the middle of a remote Alaskan saltwater mudflat, Adrian Knops was literally hanging on for his life. Adrian wasn't sure he'd make it through the first night, much less the second or the third nights, as a drenching rain plagued him day after day, but he held on. The tides crept higher and higher with each cycle. The storm grew and pounded the mudflat with rain, obliterating Adrian's handmade SOS. And on Thursday... It was like there was a wall, and it was five mile an hour wind turned into a 70 mile an hour wind, like that. Whoa, you know, your clothes are just fluttering back. I was semi-hypothermic. I was like, man, I, I may not get out of here. But Adrian was driven by his desire to live and to be able to tell his family, and especially Garrett's, what had happened to him. My whole personal focus out here, and that's why this area doesn't bother me. It's, it wasn't about me. Th this whole area wasn't about me. I was, I was surviving for my wife and granddaughter and kids to make sure that the families knew the right story and make sure that if I died right here, God would look at me and be happy. So in the middle of the vicious storm, thinking Thursday night might be his last, Adrian worked out a way to leave behind a record of their ordeal. I took one of Garrett's guns and I took my hunting knife. I proceeded to carve a message into the gun. In essence, it said that Garrett was from Craig, Alaska, and he died on September 15th, 2013, taking his big bear to the boat. I thought that would give him the story of what happened of our hunt and how he died. And then I said, Adrian Knopf's stuck on tidal flat, cold, wet, no food. I had it high up so that People searching a rescue, passing boaters, maybe would see this gun, even if it's three years from now. It was like I put a message in a bottle and threw it into the river, you know, and it's just, there's hope right there. Friday came. I guess I can take more than I think I can. And that gives you a resolve to keep going on more. And then about the same time in the afternoon, boom, that wind came back. The storm returned with a vengeance as if focusing all its deadly energy directly at the withered tree and the battered hunter. I thought the winds the previous two days were bad. Wow. Every time I turned around, especially with the storm, it just got worse. If the previous winds were 75, these were 100 plus winds. It forces you up on top of that tree. When I got up there, it almost blew me off. I knew I couldn't fall off in the water because by that time, the of the week, the tide was up about five feet around that tree. That was a tough afternoon.
For Adrian Canops, the last six days had been extremely tough. He started the week with four snack bars. He ate the last one two days ago. The only fresh water to drink was whatever settled in the nooks and crannies of the tree trunk. Any energy he had left, he spent clinging to that tree. But by the last night, I could tell I was getting weaker. I was so sleep deprived. I mean, at that point, it was six days with three hours of sleep. Throughout his ordeal, two things had brought Adrian comfort. Oh, please, Jehovah, I know that you are looking on. A Jehovah's Witness, Adrian began praying on day one. The prayer was more of an ongoing narrative, spoken out loud, feeling God was right there at his side helping him out. His other solace came whenever he looked out towards the mouth of the river and saw the abundance. Seeing Garrett's fishing boat still firmly anchored gave him hope. So you had a clear shot at the abundance. Were you just looking just to look at it, to see it? You know, the Coast Guard's bound to come once we're reported missing. I figured if they saw the boat, I mean, the natural thing is follow the river up. Saturday evening, the rain let up and the storm cleared just briefly, but long enough to deal Adrian one more cruel, demoralizing blow. But when it stopped right before dark, the boat was gone. I was like, oh no. You know, this, the starting point of the search has just drifted away. The violent storm had broken the abundance off its anchor and sent it out to sea with the current. The wilderness, it seemed, was going to win in Adrian's week-long fight to survive. What would be when you felt like, I'm at the bottom, this is it? It'd have to be Sunday morning. I was ready to, to collapse. Right. <laughs> I, I'm sure looking back, it was sleep deprivation, you know, a whole week with only a few hours of sleep. And that's when I said, uh, I may not make it back up on top of this tree. I just, I just laid down. I didn't have that uh, drive to stand anymore. I just had to get some rest because the pain was so intense at the, at the time. Knives in your joints and the hips. And I was like, you know, this is probably your last morning. The tides will come in midday. If you can't get back in that tree, you're dead. Adrian Knops has been stranded in the wilderness of Alaska for a week. And now, he has reached his end. And you decide to just lay down. Yeah, I just, I just laid down in the wet grass. Like you're not gonna get back up, like this uh, is the I, end. I, I knew there was a chance. Jehovah, thank you for the life that I have had. I said my last goodbyes to my family when I was laying down. I said my last prayers and Thank God for all he'd done. Thank you for the goodness that you have shown. In the pre-dawn hours of Sunday, September 22nd, a Coast Guard helicopter crew based in Sitka, Alaska, took off for the Misty Fjords wilderness. A cruise ship had just reported finding an abandoned vessel adrift in that area. It was the abundance. Well, it's the dreaded call that every fisherman family in the world dreads. A call from the Coast Guard saying the boat was found adrift with nobody on board. The four-man crew of the Coast Guard MH-60 Jayhawk helicopter didn't have a precise location to initiate a search. But Coast Guard Lieutenant Chris Enixon had a hunch. Looking at the landscape, I looked at Chickaman River. That was the first spot that would offer somebody that was going hunting a location to put ashore in a good valley to hunt. The aircraft flew low, below 300 feet, to give the rescue crewmen a better chance of spotting someone. During our search patterns, we saw packs of wolves, brown bear tracks. So there's definitely wildlife out there that could pose a threat to someone that would be out there in that situation. Out on the wet mud flat, 
a week exhausted Adrian Canops had passed out after having endured a long night in an unforgiving storm. I said my last prayer. That's the last thing I remember. What's your next memory? The noise of a helicopter right there, over the top of that river. There's a Coast Guard helicopter. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm looking at it, and it's got its tail pointed to me. So and there's no see. windows in the back. They can't see. And they can't see me. After a long week of much prayer, Adrian had one more message for God to hear. I could tell they were leaving. I said, now's your opportunity. Just turn your head. Just make him turn his head. The pilots were calling out that we were going to move on to our next search area. I just kind of happened to turn my head uh, over my, my left shoulder one last time. Just happened to see something that didn't seem natural. I realized that, oh, that's not a tree, that's a survivor. All of a sudden, that chopper just stops on a dime. door flings open and I stepped out of the aircraft and walked over to Adrian. He had uh, told me that he had been sitting there for seven days waiting for help. All right, well, uh, we're here to get you out of here. It's policy that rescue crewmen only retrieve the survivor and not any gear. But Adrian wasn't going to leave behind the rifles, especially not the one that he had carved with the story of Garrett's terrible fate. They started walking me to the helicopter and I said, we got to take these guns. And I said, Garrett's family, would want the gun with the message on it. I wanted the gun with the message on it. So they saw it and they unloaded them and brought them with. As soon as David said he was ready to go, we picked up, got max power and beat feet. David was quite concerned with how cold he was. So we wanted to get Adrian to the hospital as quick as possible fantastic helicopter ride I've ever had. They got me to catch camp probably at 15 minutes. Got me to the hospital and everything went well. Seven days in the elements is unheard of. Uh, and the fact that he was able to survive that long with minimal water and minimal food and, and no shelter is truly a miracle. You know, his attitude and positive mental state is, is the main contributor as to why he survived. He had a reason to survive, he had a will to survive, and he held on. If you would have asked me during the week, what are your two biggest enemies? Hands down, I would have said wind, and I would have said rain. Made existence miserable. And yet without the rain, where there would I have gotten fresh water to drink in the, in the quantities that I did? Even the forceful winds that tore the abundance from its anchor and set it adrift to be spotted by passing ships took on a new meaning. Without that, the family wouldn't have missed us until Sunday. The Coast Guard would have waited to see if we're just late. They would have searched till Monday or Tuesday. In the state I was in, I probably wouldn't be alive today. Once again, that enemy of the wind proved to be salvation there. After two nights in the hospital, Adrian went directly to Garrett's parents. I'm so sorry about Garrett. He returned Garrett's rifle, bearing his indelible account of their son's last moments. Garrett Hagen, Craig Alaska, died taking a big bear to the boat. I looked at the gun. I did what I thought I'd do. Oh, man. I just broke down and started crying. It was very, very emotional. Thank you. I'm glad you made it. Four days after Adrian was rescued, the Coast Guard located the drowned body of Garrett Hagen, nearly 30 miles from where his boat had been anchored. We're a very close family, and I was grieving. You know, my heart was broken. I had lost my boy, but I wasn't angry. Just recently, the photos were found on a camera that Garrett had on his person. Garrett was always a happy guy. He, he was in his element that day. The water, the mountains, he loved it. And those will be treasured photos forever for me. Adrian's survival didn't hinge on one thing in particular, 
His ongoing dialogue with God kept his mind off just how dire his circumstances really were. He used his survival skills and knowledge of wilderness to keep himself alive. But it was his faith and focus on family that fueled Adrian's epic fight to survive. <laughs>